Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's hearing, in which we're going to hear evidence from uh, a witness who was concerned with dealing with the gas supply to the tower on the night in question. Yes, good morning, Mr yes, Chairman. Uh, yes, could I ask that Mr Jason Alday is brought in, please? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence that I shall give shall, be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth and, nothing but the truth. and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alden. Sit down and make yourself comfortable there. <coughs> yes, yes, yes. Ms. Grange. Yes, thank you very much for attending today to give evidence. It's very much appreciated. Um, if you have any difficulty understanding anything I'm asking in the course of my questions, please ask me to repeat the question or put it in a different way. And if you feel you need a break at any point, please let us know. OK. Also, just try and keep your voice up so that the transcribers can hear you clearly. OK. Thank you. Uh, so can you give the inquiry your full name? It's Jason Matthew all day. And you've made two witness statements. Can I please take you to them? They're in the folder on your desk in front of you. And they will appear on the screen. Uh, the first is dated the 6th of November 2017. And that's... Met MET triple zero one two seven one zero. That's yep. at the first tab in the folder in front of you. <coughs> and the second is dated the sixth of November, twenty eighteen. That's uh, the reference is CAD quadruple zero three zero one eight. And that should be in the third tab in the folder in front of you, the pink tab. Can I check? Have you read each of those statements recently? I have, yes. And can you confirm that the contents of both are true? They are, yes. And have you discussed those statements or your evidence with anybody before coming today? I haven't, no. Thank you. And you also have the following exhibits, which I'm now just going to read into the record. Uh, that's exhibit JMA 1 to your first statement. Uh, that's MET 0012914. That's a map of the local area and the gas mains that supply the tower. We'll come back to that map in due course in your evidence. Also, there are exhibits to your second statement. That's JMA 1, maps of the area and gas mains. That's CAD quadruple zero three zero one five. JMA 2, that's emails and attached maps. That's CAD quadruple zero three zero one seven, and then JMA three to JMA five inclusive. They're maps relating to some gas governors in the area, and that's CAD quadruple zero three zero one two, CAD quadruple zero three zero one six, and CAD quadruple zero three zero one four. I've listed all of those out so they're formally added to the record. So I want to start then with Cadence Operations. You work for Cadent Gas Limited, is that right? I do, yes. And you were part of their emergency response and repair team who attended Grenfell Tower during the fire on the 14th of June. That's correct. And can you confirm that Cadent is a gas transporter and that means that it owns and operates certain national gas networks? That's correct, yeah. And in particular, does that mean that it owns and operates the gas pipes and the apparatus that supplies the gas. That's correct. And is it right that Cadent used to be called National Grid? It did, yes. And is it also right that there are a number of different gas distribution networks covering different regions in England, Wales and Scotland, and that Cadent operates the gas distribution network for North London? That's correct. And is it right that Cadent also operates something called the Gas Emergency Call Centre? We do, yes. And does that mean that Cadent receives all the calls from anyone in the UK that need help with the gas supply? That's correct. Great. Now, in terms of your own experience, is it right that in around 1997, you joined the National Grid as a gas engineer? That's correct. And since then, you've worked on gas networks for around 20 years, mostly as a repair engineer, is that correct? Mostly in repair, yes. Done replacement work as well, but mostly in repair. Yeah. Can you explain 
briefly what your role as a repair engineer typically involves. So uh, network engineer uh, for repair, uh, that involves looking after uh, an area in West London which is Fulham, which covers the west of London. Um, I have three network supervisors which report to me who each have nine to ten repair teams which then um, report to them and we basically respond to gas leak which is reported by the public. So we attend, uh, excavate and replace or fix the leaks which have been reported. Great, yeah. So you're effectively repairing gas pipes and then shutting off the supply where you need to? Correct, yeah. yeah. Now you have explained in your statement that shortly before the fire you attended some training with the fire service college about how to manage an incident on site, is that correct? I did, yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit more about what that course involved? So the course involved um, working in scenarios with the um, London Fire Brigade, or the Fire Brigade, Police, Ambulance. So you went through scenarios of uh, attending the incidents. So it could be um, a building collapse, it, it could be a major a, a crash where they've crashed into some apparatus with gas, um, a major leak. So we work with the Fire Brigade and <coughs> work how to work alongside them, how to introduce, how to get involved with their uh, communications. Um, who to be keep, kept informed, um, and how to sort of like manage the works on, on a big on a big uh, incident. Yeah. So it was about working with other agencies. Absolutely. In that kind yes. Of yeah. Yeah. And you say in your statement that you think you put this put you in a strong position and helped you understand what your role was as a category two responder in an incident like Grenfell. Is that right? It did, yeah, because when you turn up to uh, something like that, there's so many fire engines, ambulance, police, um, you know, you've got a job to do there as well. So you need to learn how to communicate with them, um, understand what they want you to do. And also it's about taking notes and, and making um, evidence of your key decisions and what you did and why you did them and when you did them. Were there any particular things that stood out for you about communication with the LFB in an incident like that? For, for Grenfell? Based on your training at the college, were there any particular things about communication with the LFB that you learned? Yeah, it's to, to, to obviously get there, be assertive with them, make sure they understand you know, who you are, what you're there for, um, so that they can help you to get to where, where you need to get to, so you can agree on a plan of work. So, Because normally they're dealing with much other bigger things at the, at the scene so we're dealing with just isolating the gas so it's obviously understanding what they need you to do and when they need you to do it. Yeah. And can you recall roughly when you did that training, how long before the fire at Grenfell? It was a few months, a couple of months beforehand, quite recent. Yeah. And just <coughs> moving on then to your role at Cadent. So you're in the operations team at Cadent, is that right? I am, yes. And you've explained that the operation team has two branches. First, it has an emergency response branch, and then it has a repair branch, is that correct? Yes. And on the 14th of June, your job title was a network engineer in the repair branch, the second branch, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So if there was a gas emergency, was it your team that was called first? Uh, it would normally, any gas emergency would be for the first FCOs to go out first. Um, they would go there as the, as the first responder for, our, for Cadent. Um, they would then classify whether, if it would be on internal pipe work, external pipe work. If it was on internal, they could isolate the pipe and make it safe. And obviously the customers would have to deal with their internal pipe work. But if it's external, which is Cadence pipe, which we transport and maintain, and they would call for a repair team for us to go out to attend to, to um, attend to the leak. Yeah. So you talked about an FCO there. Is that right? That that's a first call operative. First call operative. So yes. that's somebody from the emergency response. That's correct. That goes out. Yeah. And uh, they, as you say, they inspect the situation and work out if they can make the situation safe. That's correct. But is it right that they only work inside a building? They don't do anything external. Um, well, they still they still have to carry out. Um, activities outside to, uh, to identify whether the leak is coming from outside or inside, but they don't actually carry out any physical repair works. They just do their, it's an Ausgem survey, they, they do a survey to establish whether it's inside, outside, 
and where the leak needs to be attended to. Yeah. So if the mains need shutting off, is that your team? It would be repair, yes. Yeah. And on the night of the fire, can we just establish who was the FCO, the first call operative? Um, Jason Knightley was yeah. uh, the first one to be called to the yeah. Yeah. tower. <coughs> and turning back to your role, you're what's called a level, level seven engineer in repair. Is that a senior operations role? Um, it's, a, it's a management role. Um, yeah. so, I, so I have uh, network supervisors report to me and then they have teams reporting to them, but then I report up to my band C manager, who then reports up again to, to a band B manager, so. Yeah, so you report to someone, is it called the head of operations? I report to a network manager. Right. And then the network manager reports to the head of operations. I see. And on the night of the fire, the network manager, who was that? Tony Day. Yeah. And can you just explain the difference between your role and Mr Day's role? So um, my role would be uh, more of a delivery, um, so make sure the work gets delivered completely safely, um, looking after the teams, uh, the supervisors, looking after the patch, whereas Tony Day is the next step up. So he would have three of me, three network engineers, to deliver on a wider patch, so he would be responsible for the whole of like, West London. Yeah. And I think we just talked about the Director of Operations, and that is that who Tony Day reports to? Yes. And who was that at the time of the Grenfell fire? That was James Harrison. Yeah. And as you just said, beneath you, you have something called a network supervisor, That's is that correct. right? Yeah. And on the night of the fire, who was that? Well, I have three, um, but the, the, who, whose area, who looks after that area was Neil Milam. That's his area, which he manages on a day-to-day -day basis where the uh, tower is situated. And again, can you tell, tell us what's the difference between your role and Mr Milam's role as a network supervisor? So again, so I'm responsible for three network supervisors. Each network supervisor has their own area uh, which they manage and they manage the teams which work on that patch. So the jobs would be dispatched um, to the teams and the network supervisor would be there to, to look after the team, support the teams, anything they need make sure that their performance is, is um, up to speed and make sure they need anything that they need, they would support them like that. Yeah. So as you said, there are repair teams that report in to Mr Milam. Um, and is it right that, like emergency teams, those repair teams are on call overnight? Yes, they, they, do, a, they do a call out shift as well, yes. And so they deal with situations which are beyond the scope of an emergency FCO, an emergency first call operative. So, sorry, say that again? So those repair teams, they deal with situations which are beyond the remit of an FCO. Yes, they're different. They, they, they take out different roles, yeah. Yeah. Well, if I've understood you correctly, the FCO really goes to see what the problem is. Correct, yeah, he and goes there. He, he identifies the problem, which might be interior or exterior. Yeah. And then, depending on what he finds, he calls in relevant people, certainly for the exterior problem. That's right. One of your... So they're, they're like classifiers, up. like you say, they, they classify to whether it needs to be attended by a team yeah. or whether it can be, it's on internal pipe work, which the customer owns. So that would be sort of, as an example, if you've got your, your, where your gas meter is, the pipe comes in, yeah. it goes through the meter, and once it goes out the other side, that's the customer's, they right. own that pipe work. So if the leak's on that side, that's for them to have to get a right. qualified person in. But if it's beforehand, it's yeah. for cadence to... Just to get to complete the picture, um, if the FCO finds that it's a leak internally, is he the man who turns off the supply outside the house? No, so if it would be inside, he would, there would be an isolation valve next to where the meter was, so oh, he would turn the... it off there and then cap it, and then that would be made safe inside, so there'd be no gas going into the meter, so that would be made safe okay. like that. And that's about the limit of his action? Yes. Yeah, Sorry. that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. And during the night of the fire, is it right that you ran all the operations and you briefed all the repair teams and you were the main point of contact for the LFB? Is That's that right? correct. And on that night, <coughs> did you take all the major decisions in conjunction with your manager, Tony Day? Yeah, we discussed with uh, the decisions, some with James Harrison as well, but um, predominantly I was feeding to Tony Day and Tony Day would then feed into James. Yeah. So let's come to the night of the fire now. Um, you've explained in your witness statement that you were not actually on standby 
uh, that night, the 13th, 14th of June, and that you would not have expected to be contacted about the incident. Is that right? Out of hours, that's correct, yes, because um, I wasn't on standby for that night. Um, once it, it, the, the call-out starts and it finishes at 8 o'clock in the morning, so after that time, because I was responsible for that area, I would have been told about it, but not until that time. Yeah. And your colleague, Robert Benn, was the person on standby. Is he that was, correct? yes. Um, and do you understand that he was notified by Cadent Dispatch on the night? He was, yes. Yeah. Um, you say that on the 14th you were supposed to go to a training course with your manager, that you woke around 5.30 and saw the news about the fire, is that correct? Uh, it, well, it wasn't a training course, it was a, it was a planning Sorry. meeting. Yeah. Yeah, um, up but in you the were Midlands, meant to be somebody but, uh, doing yes, something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you woke, you saw the news of the fire and then you called Tony Day? I did, yes. And is it right that you both agreed that you would go to the tower? That's correct. Even though you weren't on standby, why did you decide to go? Um, we was actually working in the area. Um, we had a, a large job um, going on quite close to the tower and we knew that there was, from local experience, we knew that there was gas present around the area. So um, again, from my experience of attending the training course at Morton on the March with a fire brigade, I was pretty confident they'd be needing our assistance, so I just thought the quicker we could get there, we could get plans in place as quick as we could. Yeah. You, you talk about your knowledge of the area. Um, what, what were the specific works that you'd had going on in that area? We was currently dealing with a, a medium pressure leak, um, which was a 36-inch main, which, is, which was um, fractured, um, which isn't uncommon. We do get fractured pipes, and we have to, um, we have to fix them. So we was currently working on a... 36 inch medium pressure fractured main in Bramley Road, which was quite um, close to the uh, tower. We actually had the road closed there at the time because it was right in the middle of the road. So there was quite some engineering yeah. works going on there at that point. Yeah, but that meant you knew the area well, is that right? Yeah, I did because we had, I say road closure, we had a diversion in place as well. So I'd walked the diversion a couple of times so I, I understood it um, with, with the traffic management company. So, and it did take us round near to the tower. Yeah. Now, in terms of your knowledge of what happened before you arrived, you say that between 5.30 or 6, you spoke to Mr. Milan. Is that right? Uh, yes, I did, yeah. Um, you say that he says he'd already been contacted and he was heading off to the tower and he'd arranged for a repair team to attend. Is that right? Yeah, the, the dispatch centre had already um, dispatched the job to a repair team and also spoken to Neil Milam as well, who was aware of that. Did Mr Milam say anything else to you at that time when you spoke to him? Regarding? Just the incident or what he was dealing with? Not, not really, no. no. Not, only that it was a, a large fire and that we would both be heading to site. And you say you left your house around 6.15am, is that right? That's correct, yeah. And that on the way you called Dave Edwards, is, who was already on site, is that right? Yes, because Dave Edwards was the level seven network engineer for the FCO side that night. So he had um, operatives on site. <coughs> and he, he also, I also knew to speak to him because he knew he was on site um, and to get some information off of David. Yeah. And is it right he's in the emergency response branch of That's the operations correct. team? Yes. Yeah. So he's like the mirror image. Yeah. Can we just look at what you say about that call with Mr. Edwards? Can we call up um, on the screen, please, your first statement? That's uh, MET 000 12710 at page 4, paragraph 18. Great. So just picking that up three lines down, you say, Dave explained that the whole block of flats was on fire and that there were multiple emergency services on site. He told me that a repair team was already on site and explained that he had been to the LFB command unit to confirm our presence on site at around 4.45 a.m. The command unit was located on Bramley Road near Grenfell Tower. I understand that the LFB coordinated their rescue operation from this command unit. The fire officers inside the command unit had asked Dave Edwards and the team to stand by in the local area and await further instructions. That's correct, that's what you're saying? That's correct, yeah. 
Do you know if Mr Edwards was given a reason by the LFB to stand by when he spoke to them at that time? He didn't give me a reason. He just said that he'd been in to make contact to inform them that um, we, Caden, were on site and um, they're at their disposal if they want us to action anything, but he was told just to stand by at that point. Now, Mr Edwards says in his statement that at that time he spoke to a lady who he believes to be the LFB commissioner, Danny Cotton, and that he asked if there was anything the LFB needed. Did he tell you he had spoken to the commissioner, Danny Cotton? He didn't mention a name to me. He, he just said that he'd been to the command unit. Yeah. Now, before your arrival, I think you mentioned this earlier, the FCO, the first call operative, was also on site. Is that right? That's Mr Knightley? Yes. In his statement, Mr Knightley explains that he'd been called at 3.22 and he arrived at site around 3.48. Is that your understanding? From, from what I've seen, that's correct, yes. And he says that he gave his contact details to two firemen and asked them to pass those on to the command unit. Is that, again, is that your understanding of what he'd done? That's what I was told, yeah. yes. And he also says that around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, he reported to the incident unit on Bramley Road. He gave his name and number and again was told to stand by. Is that your understanding of what happened? That's correct, yes. Again, do you know if Mr Knightley was given a reason at that time why he should stand by? I wasn't aware of any reason, no. Would Mr Knightley or Mr Edwards have been able to approach or access the tower, including the basement, without an instruction from the LFB? At that time, I wasn't on site, so I, I wouldn't know. But what I do know is when I got to site, they wouldn't have got to it because of the cordons that were set up. They wouldn't have been able to get near enough to the tower to access it. And you don't think it was, would have been possible to get through the cordons? or? If they spoke, and if they, if they spoke to the... Um, uh, the police and the LFB on the cordons, they, they may have been, but what they were going to do, I, I, I'm not sure, because of the, obviously the severity of the fire. Yeah. Now, you also say that although you were familiar with the local area around the tower, you didn't have any knowledge of internal gas pipe work in the tower, and therefore you called Patrick Kelly, who works in the contract management team at Caden, is that that's, right? That's correct, yes. And why did you call him? So I spoke to Pat because Pat is um, he's the, the contract specialist for mobs, which is multi-occupancy buildings. Um, and I was aware that there was some works going on in the area. I didn't know at that time it was Grenfell, but I was aware there was some uh, repair riser works, which is carried out by our contract partner um, at that time. So I just phoned Pat to see if he was aware of the building and if he knew of the supplies into the building, which he did, and he informed me um, that there was some works going on and that there was internal risers in Grenfell Tower. Did he tell you that there'd been a gas riser replacement going on? He did inform me that one of the, there, there was one currently being replaced, yes. Yeah. Can you just briefly explain what a gas riser is? So a gas riser is, uh, is the main gas pipe which will come into a building, so a high-rise building, um, it could be one, two, three, four different, if you build a square building in each corner, or it could be one going up the middle. But basically, it's the main riser pipe which comes in from underground, goes through the building, and then will tee off in, in laterals into each flat who has gas. Yeah. Can we just look at paragraph 19 of your statement now? <coughs> if we go into that, that's on the same page. And you say this about what Patrick. Kelly told you in the last part of that paragraph, you say Patrick Kelly's last three lines. Patrick Kelly confirmed to me that there was gas supplied within the building via four internal gas risers <coughs> and that there were valves on the risers in the sub basement of the building, albeit that they were at a high level. So you knew at that point that there were these risers in the basement but at high level. Correct, yes. yes. And did you have any discussion at that time with Mr Kelly about the options that might be available to you for isolating the gas supply to the tower? Um, we, discussed, we did discuss um, there were valves internally in, in the sub-basement. 
this was on my on my way to site. I was en route, so I'd seen on the telly uh, what I'd seen, and then obviously once I got closer and closer, um, I didn't think that there was going to be an option to get in. And, and Pat said, if you can get in, they're going to be high level, so you, you'll probably more than likely may need a ladder or, or something to get up to them. But I didn't think that we'd be um, going into that basement because of the severity of the fire. Now, in terms of your arrival um, and your approaching the tower, you say that you arrived around 7.20 a.m., is that right? That's correct. And this is recorded in a, a cadent timeline that we have for the night. If we could just bring that up on the screen, that's CAD 702. We can just zoom in. The entry at 87 on that page is just beyond the halfway point, that's it. Um, do you know whether this timeline was prepared contemporaneously or has been created after the event? This has been, I believe, created after the event. Right. So the, time, the times would have been taken from, I believe, statements from um, other witnesses on site, but it's been put together as one afterwards. Okay. So this isn't the same as the dispatch centre incident log? It could have been taken from it, but it may have been added to as well. I see. Okay. Have you had a chance to look at this log? I have, and yes. And check its accuracy? Um, yes, I have, yeah. And do you consider the timings to be accurate in it? For, for the entries for myself, I believe so, yes. Yeah. And did you have this timeline when you were preparing your statement? It sounds like you might not have done from what you just said. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. I have my own timelines of, my, like I said, I had my diary with my key decisions in and I made times against them as for instance, when I arrived on site, when I went to the command units, et cetera, et cetera. I made notes of my own times. Okay. And you checked those before you wrote your statement? Yes. Yeah. Now, you say you approach from Oxford Gardens, which is northwest of the tower. Is that right? That's correct. Can we just go back to your statement then? So if we can go back to MET, M-E-T, triple zero, one, two, seven, one, oh on page four, paragraph 20. If we can zoom in on that, yeah. So picking it up in the second line, you say, as I was driving from Hangar Lane, I could see the smoke. I had never seen such a devastating fire. When I first pulled up, I could only see the top third of the building, which was on fire with debris coming off it. I could not believe what I was seeing and spent the first couple of minutes after I had arrived just looking at the scenes around me. And I, I also want to go to what you say two paragraphs later, paragraph 23 on page five, please. We can zoom in on that. So you say, I knew that there was gas being supplied into the tower, and as soon as I saw the fire, I realized that we would need to turn off the supply of gas <coughs> as soon as possible. When I arrived on site, we could not get anywhere near the tower. The flames were still burning, debris from the building was falling to the floor, and the police were keeping everyone away from the tower. As soon as I saw the fire, it was clear to me that we would not be able to approach the tower to operate any service isolation valves, <coughs> and that we would therefore need to disconnect the supply of gas by isolating the mains in the network. Now, just pausing there, I want to ask you a few questions about those paragraphs. You say that you realised you had to turn the gas off as soon as possible. Why exactly was that? I think from previous experience and previous fires that I've been to, um, big warehouses, um, other um, big blocks of maybe rows of houses where you just can't get close enough to isolate the supply. So basically, then your next step back is to isolate the main, which feeds the services. So you're isolating a bigger section. Knowing that there's gas in the building, eventually, at some point, that gas pipe could potentially rupture. Therefore, with a fire, it's gonna now add fuel to that fire. And with gas, uh, obviously, if, if, the, if the fire brigade just keep ignite, uh, putting the gas out, then you've got gas, um, just releasing from an open-ended pipe, perhaps, which then you've got um, 
even more potential of an explosion or something like that. So it was just from previous experience knowing that the safest thing to do would be to isolate the gas from the building. Yeah. Did you form a view at that time as to whether there were any gas fires burning in the tower? Not at that time, no. Not at that time. I didn't have heard, because it was, like I say, I could only see that when I pulled up by Latimer Road Station, I could really, looking over the station, I could really only see the top third of the building, which was smouldering but still alight, so I couldn't say that I could see gas fires inside the building at that point. And, and you've just mentioned that. You say you couldn't get close to the tower. Why was that at that time? There was cordons uh, everywhere. There was lots of people everywhere. Um, at that time, I wasn't sure who I was going to be speaking to, who's going to let me through. So it was just really a, a, um, an initial sort of site assessment of where we were, what, what was there, and how we was going to get around these obstacles. Yeah. <laughs> was anybody actually preventing you from approaching the tower? Um, not exactly, but I wouldn't just want to go and approach the tower really closely until I knew what I was doing. Um, obviously, there were cordons there. If we'd have said to the uh, emergency services that we were the gas there to come and to isolate, then I'm sure no one would have stopped us. But then again, it was such a big fire and there was stuff coming off of it. I didn't want to put anybody at danger by just approaching the tower without having some kind of plan in place. Now, you say what you did was that you went to something called the Cadent Muster Point, which Mr Edwards had established. Can you just explain, it might sound obvious, but what a muster point is? So, so for us, it's a muster point where everybody on site is aware of where that location is. Should there be any emergency, should there be anything happen, everyone would be told to get back to the same area so we could check everybody was safe and everybody was present. Yeah. And was that muster point at Dover House on Darfield Way? That's correct, yeah. yes. We can have a look at that. So if we go to an exhibit uh, of, of Mr Dave Edwards, if we go to MET, M-E-T, triple zero, one, two, nine, one, two. So that is a map of the area that was marked up by Mr Edwards. <coughs> Sorry, it's not... It's not very clear on the screen, it's not very big writing, but am I right? So in the middle of that, we have, that's it there, we have a red marker, that's the tower, that's, that's Grenfell correct. Tower, is yep. that right? And then we can see various red lines coming off it. We're going to look at those in, in more detail in a little while, but those are gas mains, is that right? Coming they are, off yes. the tower. Yep. Those red points. Uh, and we can, if we orientate ourselves, we have station walk then uh, down the, the left hand side, down the west side, running down there. And we have Bramley Road that goes up then to the north. Yep. Um, if we go up to the top left, we can see Darfield Way. And is it right? I think Mr. Um, Edwards says it's point nine, which is the muster point. So I think actually we've got the wrong, I think we've got, oh yeah, sorry, there's point nine. Yeah, point nine, exactly, the little black dot near Darfield Way. Yeah, if that, so your muster point was up in that uh, top left-hand corner. That, that looks correct, yes. That's where, if that's where Dover House was, that's where we were. There's a reason why Dover House was chosen. If you can see from that map, um, we, we're sort of east, uh, west away from that and that we, was, uh, we wanted to find a place where, because there was lots of people milling around, so we needed to find a place where we was out of the way so that we could communicate between ourselves and put a plan in place and where it was accessible for us to get our vehicles and, and bits and pieces nearby. So we chose that because it was just tucked out of the way a little bit as well. Yeah, yeah. Now, while we've got that map open, Mr Edwards has marked the location of the LFB command unit that he was aware of. That's at point 10, so that's down, uh, yeah, exactly, down there towards the bottom yep. on Bramley Road. Uh, again, does that accord with your recollection as to <coughs> command unit? That was a command unit. Yeah. Um, it wasn't the one which I eventually was the one I was going to, but that was the first one I went to, yes. Okay, yeah. So I just want to turn now briefly to your role as a Category 2 responder. We've touched on this uh, a little earlier. 
you mentioned uh, that shortly before the fire you'd had this training about working with other agencies. Can you explain what Cadence role was on the night in the particular circumstances you faced as what? a Category 2 responder? So, so we was there as, um, as a request from the emergency services to support them with isolating gas if required. And what was your role in contrast with the LFB role? Um, sorry, I'm not sure. So they were Category 1 responders, yes. yeah, they? Yeah. Uh, how would you describe the difference between what you were there to do and what they were doing? So, so they're, they're, they're blue light um, responders. They're, they're their emergency. They get there really quick. They have to obviously deal with the fire, um, the people, uh, everything that's on, on site. We're, we're just there to deal with the gas. That, that's what we deal with. And who has the primacy on site in that situation? The Category 1 responders, so the, the fire, the emergency services. And is it right that you don't act unless you're ordered to do so? Correct. So you've said that after your arrival on site at 7.45, you went to the LFB command unit. Um, you, you just explained that in a moment, a moment ago. Is that point 10 on this map where that, you say you went that, to? That's the first one I went to, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I was told to go from there uh, to the other main ones, which I don't think are marked on this map, actually. No, I don't think they are. But, but yeah. I, that, that's where I was told to go from there to, to where the, there was another two or three parts up round by where Lancaster Green is there. There was parts up round there. That's where I went round to. Yeah. So you arrived on site at 7.20. <coughs> you didn't get to the command unit until 7.45. Can you just recall what you were doing in between? Um, just risk assessing the, the, the area, trying to find out who was on site, who was on their way to site, what, what resource we had available, um, looking at the maps to see what, what gas mains were there, trying to sort of put a, a plan in place so when I went to the uh, command unit I had a plan to give them uh, it, should they want it rather than just go there and then go away and then make a plan I wanted to have some information prepared for them um, as what I thought would be a plan of action to take to isolate the gas. Yeah. Um, let's look at your statement again. Um, so this is um, MET 0012710. At page 5, paragraph 24. And again, picking it up just over halfway down, you say, however, I decided to go to the LFB command unit to speak with the fire officers to ask whether they wanted us to disconnect the supply of gas. At approximately 7.45 a.m., I went to introduce myself to one of the LFB fire officers, who I think was called Julian in the command unit and ask whether they wanted us to disconnect the supply of gas. He confirmed that they did. At that stage, the incident commander was aware that Cadent had not started the operation to disconnect the supplies of gas to the building. So that's your evidence about that. So as far as you are aware, was this the first time that the LFB confirmed to Cadent that they wanted the gas supply shut off? I believe so, yes, because when I went to the command unit, it was... Again, it was really difficult to actually grab someone's attention to who I was. There was so much going on in there. There was conversations going you know, everywhere. So I actually you know, made it quite clear that who I was and what I was there for. Um, and I don't think that anybody at that point had made that decision to, to isolate the gas. So that was the first point that they, they, they basically said to us, yeah, we want, it, we want it to be isolated. And was ex any explanation given to you as to why they were giving you the go-ahead at that point, at that time? Um, no, it's no real explanation other than that, I would assume again, that the experience says that in a building which is on fire, that much fire with a potential ignition source in there with, with gas, then it was the um, procedure to make sure that then was isolated to take away that potential of, of further fuel burning the fire. Yeah. You refer in that paragraph to an LFB fire officer who you think was called Julian. Do you think that might have been Julian Spooner? Did you know his name on the night? Again, a little bit disappointed myself because from my training, I was always told to get names, but I just I was on the buzz and I was first names only, and I was write, writing names down. And I honestly couldn't That's remember right. who his yeah. surname was, no. OK, so I now want to turn to the different options you had available to you for shutting off the gas. So um, 
As we saw just a moment ago with reference to paragraph 23 of your statement, you said that from the moment you saw the fire, it was clear that you would not be able to approach the tower to operate any service isolation valves. Is that right? Correct. Now, are these service isolation valves also sometimes called pipeline isolation valves or PIVs? Correct, yeah. So they could be SIVs or PIVs? They could, yes. Yeah. So can you explain how you would normally isolate the gas supply using those valves? So if the <coughs> valve was accessible, uh, they're normally within one to two metres of the building, uh, the pipeline isolation valves. They're normally um, recognised by a, a box on the floor. Uh, it could be yellow, could be black, could be metal, could be plastic, and it will say gas of some sort on that. And they're normally in line with where the supplies go into the, to the buildings. So if the fire was around the back of the building and it wasn't affecting us, you could go to that isolation valve, get the lid up as long as it's clear and you turn off. However, you wouldn't just leave that valve turned off, you'd still have to do a physical isolation behind because these valves, although they could turn off, there's obviously it's a valve and they're not, there's always potential the gas could seat past that valve at some point. So you always, our procedures are that we do a physical isolation behind the valve. So instant off, and then you still do an excavation behind to isolate. Yeah. So you would always expect to find these close to a building, yes? You'd expect them to be there, but it's not uncommon for them not to be identifiable due to um, uh, refurbishment of the pavements, slabbing, um, Curbs move, parking spaces get put in, sometimes get tarmacked over. You know, they, they should be there, but they're not always 100% identifiable. Okay, yeah. Um, and if they are covered over, what would normally happen? So if they was covered over, and we don't know exactly where they were, we would then try and identify by a, a equipment to trace the pipe out um, from where it comes out from the building, and then do an excavation to isolate the supply. Would you expect to have plans available to you to be able to work out their location? For services into buildings, not, 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 not all services are digitised into buildings. Um, the mains which surround the area, everything there is on our maps, but not all supplies are digitised onto our maps. So in terms of your maps and the mains coming in, would you expect the, the, the locations of these isolation valves to be on those maps? For Grenfell or generally? For any building. If, they, if they're on the map, then they, they would be in the right location because the, the building is always been there. So when they actually plot that, it should be within that area of where they've put the valve to be, yes. At Grenfell, do you know if those were accessible? The valves? Yeah. No, completely not because there was so much debris on the floor, there was no way to get to them valves at all. We'll come to that in a moment, but do you know whether they had been covered over at all? I don't because I hadn't walked around the building um, prior to the fire, so I wouldn't be able to confirm or, or deny that if they were uh, there. So, so turning to, to approaching the tower to turn off the valves, can you explain why you didn't do that on the night? What, go to the valves? Try and access those, those valves, yeah. Try and find the locations. So... What, what were the difficulties well, the, with doing that? Not getting, being able to get close enough to the building because there was still burning debris falling from the building. So we knew from the map where they showed the valves, but that was on the, the south side, I believe, of the building. And that, that was just completely not accessible to get anywhere near that to even look for them because it was just too dangerous. The second option is internal shut-off. So is it right that you can also shut off the gas by isolating the valves on the, the risers in the building? Is that right? Yes, yeah, so not all buildings are the same, but this partic particular building had a sub-basement where they'd brought the pipes into. Um, so they would have had potentially had valves inside. Well, from Pat Kelly's uh, knowledge, he told me that they did. So there was valves inside there. Um, they're construction valves, but they could also act as pipeline <coughs> isolation valves as well. They could be, be used the same to shut the supply off. Yeah. But as I say, you'd still have to do a physical isolation outside to make sure that pipe's completely 
mm. isolated from entering the building. Are they sometimes known as branch or riser isolation valves? Correct. Yep. Um, so when you were formulating your plan for isolating the gas supply at Grenfell, did you think about accessing the basement at that time? No. Why not? Because the building was... It just looked like it was a, a big fireball. It was completely alight. And um, although I'd seen some fire officers go in and out, I just didn't think that we'd be able to access um, that basement at all. So that you didn't think that was an option for you at that time? At that time, no. <coughs> so I want to turn to another method of shutting off the gas supply, which is to do with something called governors, gas governors. So you've explained in your statement that it's sometimes possible in some circumstances to use these governors to shut off the gas supply. Is it right that governors are a mechanism in a gas network that reduces medium pressure to low pressure? That's Is that correct, right? yeah. Um, can we just have a look at a map of the governors in the area of Grenfell Tower? So if we go to your exhibit JMA3 to your second statement, that's CAD quadruple zero three zero one two. Now, it's not hugely clear on this um, screen, but is it right that there are little brown arrows dotted around uh, this screen? Are they um, governors? Yeah, they're governors or um, another way of pressure-reducing stations or systems. That's what we call them. Pressure-reducing pressure stations. stations, yes. Yeah. And is it right, again, it's very hard to read on this map, but the Grenfell Tower and the location of Grenfell is right in the bottom left-hand corner of this map? Um, it's, it's not the bottom two, it's up the next one up. It's Just there? Of, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Great, that's helpful. Now, can you explain to us whether shutting off the governors was an option at Grenfell Tower? Uh, an option, but not a viable one. Can you explain why? Because as you can see, there's, um, it wouldn't, you'd have to shut one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, at least ten. There might be another one there, I thought. So basically, if we shut the one at, um, at Grenfell, all the other brown arrows, they would just force gas back to that location. So you, you'd have to shut all of them governors off to be able to close the gas supply off. To the right. tower. Yeah. To be fair to you, I think this might get clearer. Can we look at JMA four, which is at CAD triple uh, quadruple zero three zero one six? Now, can you explain to us what that map, that different coloured map, is showing there? So again, Grenfell is is just up at about two thirds away down from the top. Is the red. So basically, the Latimer Road governor is the main pressure reducing system feeding that area. So that's where the main so gas... So that little, that little red network that we've got on the bottom left, yep. that's the Latimer Road network that's served by that governor Correct, there. Yep. yeah. So and that's you, where Grenfell Tower is, That's yeah? correct, you, yeah. you can, there is, it is written on here, but it's it, very hard to see. Mm. Yep. So if you were to turn that one off, basically then if you go to the next nearest one, I think it's Kensal Green... Um, which is just up to the north, which yeah. is all the blue, that yeah. would then work harder, and then that would push gas back into the system that way. And these governors, in effect, like taps. <clears throat> so that if you turn one off, another one will open further in order to... Correct. ..keep the pressure up. That's absolutely right, yeah. So basically, it's you turn one, and the next one will just work harder, yeah. and so forth and so on. So obviously, you know, if you turn them all off, eventually the pressure would start to drop because one wouldn't be able... The demand of one wouldn't be able to feed the whole lot, but it would not isolate um, the supplies. And if you had a turned all of them governors off, as you can see, all that pipe work, that's all going to be holding gas. Mm. And with the time of year and the amount of... Um, it was really hot, so not a lot of demand on there. It would take a hell of a long time to burn all that gas off in that system. I see. So even once you've isolated the governors or turned them down, you've then got the difficulty, you've got the existing gas in the pipe Correct. that would have to dissipate. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you say that in order to guarantee 
uh, cutting off the gas supply, you'd also have to cut the mains as well. Why, why is that? Again, they're all on valves, which valves are, you know, some valves have been in there many, many years. They, they make mica seal, but again, there could be a slight let by. So you'd have to, again, physically drop down behind them and do an isolation on them. Um, some of the valves are newer, um, which are, which are uh, triple five figure five valves, which are a newer valve. We're allowed to turn them off and just put a blank behind them, but you still have to physically drop down and do them works. Um, you just can't leave valves turned off. I see. Uh, just so I understand, um, <clears throat> if you're going to do a physical shut off behind the valve, does that involve cutting the pipe? And it does. So yes, it, so basically then you have to excavations and then we have flow stopping equipment which we have to insert into the, into the pipes to so do a physical cut, cut a section out and then put caps on. We're going to come back to that kind of operation in, in a moment. So you have said in short in your latest statement that shutting down the governors would have been a much more complex operation than the one you actually undertook at Grenfell, which we'll come to in a moment. Is that right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, definitely. Did it even enter your mind to, to, to think about shutting the governors down? We, we had a conversation um, about it. We did. So looking at this picture, this is what we use for what we call network analysis. So we can understand how the whole system's configurated. So we had a quick look and we, our network analysis, we looked how many governors there would be required to be shut down and, and the time it took. So it was, it was, it was in our thought process, it was uh, an option, but it got dismissed quite quickly. Yeah. I think you've answered this already. So uh, um, how long does it typically take um, to reduce the amount of gas being supplied by isolating the governors? Does that depend on how much gas is in the system? Yeah, how big absolutely. The network what what, is? what yeah. the demand is. Oh, there's all sorts of factors into that, yeah. yeah. Mr. Chairman, that mm -hmm. is a convenient moment because I'm about to get to some detailed questions about the, the option that they did pursue on the night. And, and there's right. a se sequence of questions that I'd like to be as a continuum. Yes, of course. So, so we shall have a break if now. If we could have a break now, yeah. that would be convenient. Well, Mr. Alday, we have a break roughly once an hour because I think most people find giving evidence is quite tiring. So we'll stop now for 10 minutes. I'm going to ask you not to talk about your evidence to anyone once you leave the room. And we'll resume at 5 past 11 okay. for some more questions. OK. All right. Now to go to the usher, please. Thank you. Five past eleven, then, please.
Right, Mr. Rawley. Yeah, thank you. Carry on. Yes, Ms. Green. Yes, thank you. So I want to turn then to the option that you did decide to pursue on the night, and, and in the event you decided that the option of cutting off the mains at three identified points in streets nearby to Grenfell was the appropriate option. Can you just briefly explain why you thought that was the best option you had? So um, the, the gas mains going towards Grenfell Tower, um, there was three feeds going towards it, so you'd have to isolate every one to get a physical isolation. So um, the locations were near enough to isolate, but safe enough for us to work at at mm -hmm. the time. So that's why we chose them locations. Yeah. And you say that in order to decide what to do, you looked at some plans of the mains, is that right? Correct, yes. Um, you've now exhibited the maps that you say were available on the night, and we're going to come back to those uh, in a moment. Is it right that these maps come from um, laptops or something called Go Books? Yes, yeah, so the field force engineers, the guys working out on site, they have a, a mobile device. It's called Go Book, Tough Book. It's, it's like a small lap, laptop. Um, mm -hmm and they have maps preloaded onto their systems so that they can access them to have a look where, where the mains are located in the highways and the, and the footpaths. And did you use a go-book to view the gas mains maps when you were first deciding your plan? I did, yes, because um, David Edwards was there and he had some resource there, some other FCOs, um, and I asked to use one of theirs so I could get the maps up to have a look for myself. Yeah. Mm. You said you also had um, hard copy um, of these maps. Um, how did you obtain those hard copies? So there was two. So, so David Edwards managed to go to a shop and managed to get them printed from a shop for us. And also Neil Marlam uh, went to the depot en route into Fulham and grabbed some drawings and maps from there as well. And you've said that you arranged for more paper copies to be printed during the day. Why, why did you need those? Um, Again, it was just to either get some um, like, like some blown up versions or some zoomed in versions so that we could see how the network was configured. Yeah. yeah. So the purpose of getting those hard copies, was it to try and make some of it a bit clearer? Correct, yeah. I see. Now, using those maps, you say that you thought it was best to cut and cap the mains at three points in the network uh, away from the tower. Did Tony Day also think that was the best option? When I presented it to him, yeah, we discussed it. It was agreed that that would be the best option, yeah. And did your recent knowledge of the area help you in making that decision? Um, it did, yes. How? Because, again, knowing the configuration of the way the mains were, um, it was, and the maps, and knowing where the, what the area we were working in, that that would be the best place to do the isolations. Were any of the, we're going to look at them just now, but were any of the locations unclear on the maps you were looking at? What, what do you mean the locations unclear? The isolation point locations, were any of them unclear? Well, with everything that was going on, it was, it was quite hard to actually physically identify where they were because of where the cordons were. So we had to actually go and find them first, where we were going to go, go and do the isolation. So once we'd found them, they wasn't unclear, but we had to find them first. I see, yeah. So let's go now. Um, I want to start with your exhibit, JMA1, to your first statement. That's at MET, MET, 0012914. Yes. Now, is it right that this is a diagram that was made after the fire? Correct. And I think you say in your second statement um, you didn't use it on the night, but it was produced um, for the purposes of preparing your police statement. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah. Now, given that you've marked this one, I, I just want to start by using this one, and we're going to go to some other maps in a moment. Now, you decided to cut the gas at three points. Um, point three of this diagram, on the right, we see Grenfell Road. Is that right, that that was one of the isolation points there? That's correct. And is it right that that was a, a pipe that was a 180 millimetre gas pipe? Yeah, because the, the old um, metallic system is metric, or imperial, and the new um, plastic is metric, so it was, that was 180 millimetre plastic, that main, mm. yeah. Yeah. So that was the f first point. Then point four of that map in the middle... 
Uh, that is Testerton Road, is that right? Yes. And that was a four-inch gas pipe, is that correct? Yeah, that was four-inch steel, yes. Yeah. And do those two marks there, the three and four, correctly show the, the position of the isolation point, as far as you can recall? The, well, they're, 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 in that they're in that vicinity. They're not accurate, but they're, that's quite close to where they were, yes. OK. Then point five of that map along, keep going exactly to the, to the left, um, that's on Station Walk, is that right? That's correct. You decided to cut that one as well. And is it right that the isolation point there was further northeast than both Latimer Road Station and where Station Walk meets Bramley Road. So was it up Station Walk, the isolation back, back point? Back towards where Station Walk says, yeah, back, back, I'd say it's probably south a little bit, yes. So do you think it was a little bit south of where Five is on this map? Correct, yeah. South down Station Walk, back Correct. towards the Tube Station? So if you were to take the S from the station, just, yeah. so, just south of that. Okay, so if the little dot hovers on the S for Station... No, no, no the, the other one. Yeah. So you're saying it's just south of there? Yeah, so that's right, yeah. just about here. Okay. Hmm. That's helpful. Can you just explain briefly the reasons why you chose those particular isolation points? So once I'd uh, made contact with the NFB, I, I'd had these sort of there or thereabouts, these isolation points in my head, that's where I wanted to do them. Um, and then once, well, in actual fact, I wanted to do them a little bit nearer the tower, the isolations originally, but when we went, the fire brigade took me through <coughs> to where all the points were, it just wasn't gonna be physical to A, get, get the men safe enough um, and close enough to do them there with what was going on. And there was far too much, there was fire, like pumps, aerial platforms, There's, there was so much other stuff down there that we wouldn't have been able to excavate there because of what was going on. So we, I actually pulled everything back a little bit from the original um, points. Same mains, but just literally pulled them back a little bit to um, locations where we could work safely without getting in the way with anybody else and, and do it safely. Yeah. And is it right that, um, certainly for three and four, they're actually quite close to the tower, perhaps within 30 metres? Yeah, three, you say? Th three... Three was probably 30, four was probably less than 20, I'd say. Four less than 20 metres from the tower. Quite close, yeah. 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 And is it right that um, you needed to cut all three in order to stop the Correct. gas supply? And had you tried to do it further away, might you have had to cut more points? Yeah, so if you, was just as, a, as an example, take three uh, and go back south up to more, more towards where... Bonmore Road is, as you can see, there's other supplies then coming in into that, which would then have fed back into the tower. So, yeah. so you're talking about this branch here, south of three? Correct, yeah. So that if, you were, if I was south of that branch, then obviously that would have fed in. Um, you know, so if the further back you come, the, the more isolations we'd have to have taken out to get a physical isolation. Yeah. Now, I want to focus now for... Um, a little while on point five on Station Walk that we just talked about, which is a little bit further down Station Walk than on that map. Now, you say you only discovered that that main on Station Walk was a 15-inch main as opposed to a 12-inch main when your team actually managed to excavate it later on in the evening of the 14th. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Now, when you first identified Station Walk as the, the isolation point you wanted to use... What did you understand the diameter of that pipe to be? As per the map, so I understood it to be a 12 inch. We're gonna to come to the map in a moment and just have a look at that. Yeah. Um, was that, did you reach that view by looking at your go book map or a hard copy map? Um, I think it was a bit of both. I looked on the, originally on the go book maps and then the hard copy maps that came out to site shortly after. So let's turn then um, to Sorry, I think we've, this is the map I want to... Um, yes, let's just stick with this map for a moment. Uh, and let's just trace that main. So Station Walk has a 12 diameter little label on it. Is that correct? Towards the top of Station Walk, before it does the turn back towards the tower. 
Just yep, that's correct. 12 inch DI, which stands for yeah. ductile iron. But there's a black mark here. It's under 20, just under the number 23 that says 15 inch isolation point. Is it right that you marked that at the time you prepared your police statement? No, that mark is a symbol which will be uh, part of our mapping system. And that, that mark, are you talking about the arrow, the little arrow Sorry, pointing? no, I wasn't talking about the arrow. I, I'll come to the arrow in just one second. So you've written, somebody's written 15 inch isolation point. Oh, right, sorry, I see, see what you mean. There. Yep. Now, is that a mark that was done at the time of your police statement? Correct, that was after the event. Yeah. Yeah. And you've told us just now that, in fact, the isolation point you think was further south than there. Yeah, it was plotted, um, it was there, but it was actually, like I say, it was further back. Yeah. Now, you wanted to draw attention to the little arrow. We, we see it more clearly in another map in a moment on the corner of that kink in the pipe. Yeah. Can you just explain what that arrow means to you? That, that means to me it's either a change of um, size of pipe, change of diameter, or change of material. OK. And then coming back down towards the tower, we can see it's got 15 written there. Yeah. yeah. So let's just go then to the maps that you say you were using on the night, which are slightly less clear than this one, but let's go to those. So these are exhibited to your second statement, JA1. Can we pull up CAD quadruple zero three oh one five? Yeah, and we want just page one of that. Yeah, that's great. Now, this is hard to read, but we need to, to stick with that at the moment. Um, so this shows the whole area, and we've got Grenfell Tower in the top middle where the big X is. Is that right? That's correct. And we can see we've got a main that runs to the east of Grenfell Tower, down the right-hand side, yes? Yes. And I think we can just about read that it says 15-inch die on that, in this little box on the side. Which yes, is more clearly yep. Some other maps. So it looks from that map that the, the, the main that's running immediately to the east of Grenfell Tower is a 15-inch main. Correct. Yeah. And was that your understanding on the night? Again, I wasn't looking to do any isolations that close to the building. No. But did you have a look at what the diameter yes, was yes, yeah, at yeah. that location? Yeah. So then in terms of the isolation point that you used on Station Walk, again, the, stre the, the bit we're concerned with is the, the, the stretch that goes down Station Walk, diagonal down this page uh, from the top. You've got a little triangle at the top, again, at the corner point, the 75 degree angle yes. point. Again, what, what does that symbol tell you? Is it the same as what you just said? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a change of um, diameter of pipe or material. Change of diameter or material? Yes. So it's not telling you definitely it's change of diameter? If something's happened at that point, it's a change of pipe size or change of pipe material. Mm. Yeah. And then it, it, it heads down. Can we just then go? We have a zoomed in um, part of Station Walk. Uh, that's the second page of this exhibit. We can just go to that. Yeah, that's it. So what we seem to be looking at now is right down the kind of bottom of Station Walk towards Latimer Road. And it... As I understand it, the station walk main is, is heading up the middle of this That's and correct. up the top. Yep. Um, and then we see Latimer Road there. There's a, a label in black, 12-inch die. Yep. What is that telling you, if anything, about the station walk? That's telling me that that um, asset is 12-inch ductile iron main. But that is a little branch off the main that you actually isolated. Yeah. So it, is that telling you anything about the station walk main? So from this map, you wouldn't be able to tell, but when, I look, when you look at these maps, when you hover over the map, 
it highlights the whole asset. So every asset is split into what they call a, a pod, which is the, uh, the number of that main. So it will, it will highlight the start and the finish of that, that section of main. So if you used to hover that, you're, you're correcting what you're saying is that little stub would be 12. But if I was to hover the main which goes up towards the tower, that would also tell me the size of that main and the asset, asset ID of that main, which was confirmed to be a 12 inch. So do you remember hovering over that main on Absolutely, the night yeah. Yeah. and seeing 12 inch? Yeah. Did you personally do that? I did, yeah. Okay. I'm interested as to why, I mean, these were maps that you actually emailed. We can see that from your second statement. You were emailing these maps to others for printing purposes. So we know these were the maps you used. Why wasn't there a, a screenshot closer to where your isolation point was, further up Station Walk? Do you know why this screenshot was the one that was chosen? This one here was chosen as well for a couple of reasons. One, it shows, again, like you say, if you hovered over it, it would tell you that it's a 12. And secondly, that's that Latimer Road station, that's actually the, that's the name of the governor station. Right. So that if you can see, the blue goes into the red, and that is where the pressure is reduced. So this is actually the governor station, which we highlight. That's why we highlighted on that. Why would you be highlighting the governor station? Because that there would give us a really good indication of where the main was, because... It's all, there's boxes on the floor, and that is, is quite a large area of where the in-ground pit is. So we'd know that's where the mains come out from the pressure reducing system for us, for an indication of where to start excavating. I see. Looking for the main. So this is a useful kind of point to locate yourselves. Correct, yeah. Using this zoomed in bit of the map. Absolutely, yeah. So again, is, you know, we could have looked for the 12 slightly south where it says 63. We could have looked for it there but we wouldn't have isolated because of obviously it's coming out of the governor station. So that's why we got there and that was our route to come out back up towards the tower. I see. So you say you knew that the, um, the main that we looked at immediately east of Grenfell Tower was a 15 inch main. Yep. But you were hovering over this and seeing a 12 inch main. Is it normal for pipes to go from narrower to broader as they go into a building, or would you have expected the opposite? Um, it's not uncommon, but again, it's not that uncommon either. It's the configuration, things change over the years. Uh, the, so if you look to the east of the building, the fee coming in now is only one, 180 mil. That pipe beforehand, I haven't got um, access to them drawings, but that pipe beforehand could have been a 15 coming in from that way. So the 15 might have been coming in from that way and reducing back to the 12 that way. I don't know what the configuration of their maps were before that replacement had happened. So it wouldn't set any alarm bells ringing for you that on station walk you've got a 12, you think you've got a 12 inch main, but then you know that by the time you're coming back around the tower it's a 15 inch main. If there hadn't been replacement on the other side, I'd maybe think about that. Because I said there had been replacement, then it didn't, didn't really ring any alarm bells. If anything, um, because it was a 12 inch coming out of the governor, you know, I would have thought the opposite, that that would potentially be a mistake on maps that's been entered wrong as a 15, it should have been a 12. Yeah, just pausing there, how, I mean, how accurate are these maps when you're using them? They're pretty accurate. We do we do find um, some uh, sometimes some that are not quite so accurate. And when we do find things that are not accurate, we follow our what's called our DR4 process, so that we basically we log that so the mapping systems can get updated. So we have to go and do trial holes and confirm size, pipes, location, if they are in the road or if they're in the path, what material it is, and then we update our systems. Uh, accordingly, so these these maps go back many many years um, yeah. from years ago from the initial database. Just for completeness, I am going to take you um, to um, some exhibits to James Harrison's statement. Um, so he gave a statement to the Met Police on the 29th of June. Can we just start by looking at JAH 10, which is Met 
Yes, now he says in this, his statement that this was a copy of the map, this one that the Cadent engineers had on the night. And just to make my point good, to the east of Grenfell Tower, we can see a 15-inch diameter pipe very clearly marked. Is that right? Correct, yeah. But yeah. You, yeah. And there's also a 12-inch to the south there as well. Mm. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. So you've got a 12 inch feeding into a 15 inch around the base. So, so that, that, where that bit is ended, um, sorry, it, here, yeah. this, this part here, that 12, there's nothing to say that years ago that didn't go back round to where that 12 was. That, that could have been abandoned at some point. That, why there's a cap in there, it, there could be all sorts of um, yeah. questions and answers as to why that is. So that's a 12 there, a 15 there, and a 12 back round there. It, it's all a little bit. You know, you, it it could it could be a, an error on the on the maps, or it, it could be that there's been something changed there um, over the years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see the 15-inch diameter pipe going up the the east side along the north, and then coming off. And I think it remains. It's hard to read, but a 15-inch on that little red, exactly writing there. Yeah. So we know that at least that branch there is coming off as a 15 inch. Correct. Well, yeah. we, we never actually um, excavated around that part of the building. So, so we, we still don't know if that's no. correct. Yeah. If, if we then look at JAH1, which is MET 0008311. Now, to be clear, Mr. Harrison has said that this um, shows the mains and supply pipes as at the 14th, but wasn't in fact available on the night. Um, he says it was produced for the purposes of his police statement. Now, we see there we've got 15-inch diameter coming up round Grenfell Tower, up the, and then down. But from your recollection, is that how it was marked on the night? No, that's not. I've never seen that on any mapping system marked as a 15 inch from all the maps I looked at um, on the different devices on the night, definitely not. At that time when you were planning the operations, did you consider the possibility that this was a 15 inch main? Again, I, I chose the location on the 12 for the reason being that we could work on that 12 without having to call in um, specialist contractors, because once we go over a 12 inch, we have to use specialist contractors to do a flow stop uh, operation. So that's why I chose to work on the 12 right by where the governor was, because if it's where the governor is, you think that would be... So, so did it occur to you at that time, oh, that might be a 15 inch? Not at all. Just finally, um, on this topic, and then we'll move on, that on the cadent timeline that we looked at earlier, um, if we can bring that up, that's uh, CAD 702. At item 102, 8.50 a.m. I think that's... Sorry, page four of that exhibit, sorry. Yeah, if you can just highlight the very top box on that page, item 102. That's it. So eight, this says 8.50, Jason Alder explains the isolation plan to the LFB. We'll come to that in a moment. It describes three isolation points, and it says the third was at the rear of Bletchenden Street, 12-inch, 15-inch gas main. So at the time, were you saying it was a 12-inch, 15-inch gas no, main? No, th this was put together after, okay. put during the police statement, so while, yeah. after the event. Okay. So look, let's, let's go back to the events of the 14th of June, and you say as per this timeline, so at 8.50 that you went to the LFB to discuss your plan to isolate the three mains. Can you just explain to us um, why it took until 8.50 to, to put that plan together, what you had to do to formulate that plan? It, it was the sheer time it took to get round the site, as I'd call it, um, 
to find each location, to, to get through, to, to talk to the safety officers for the LFB to make sure they was happy with where we was going to work, to identify um, how to get all of our vehicles, plant and equipment near enough for us to work safely um, at the three locations. Um, the, the one on Station Walk, there was, it was actually a sterile area which the London Ambulance Service were using, which I'd asked them to if they could move it slightly for us so that we could get in there. Again, otherwise we would have to come back further, which would have mean more cut and cap. So there was lots of communication and planning to put into place before we confirmed with the LFB what our action plan was. And were you satisfied at that point that the cadent personnel that had been on site since before your arrival had done everything they could have been expected to do up to that point? Yes. So you deal with this in your, your witness statement, um, the, the formulation of the plan and presenting it to the LFB. Can we go to that? That's um, met 00012710 at paragraph 38 on page 8. Yes, so you say at around 8.50 a.m., I went to speak with the LFB again to discuss our proposed plan. It was difficult to speak with the LFB when we first arrived on site. It was clear that the focus was not on Cadent and that we were not, understandably, an immediate priority for them. I went through the proposed plan with the LFB and showed them the proposed isolation points on a map. They confirmed that they were happy for us to carry out excavations in the proposed locations. I liaised with the LFB safety officers at each of the proposed isolation points and communicated with the LFB constantly whilst monitoring each of the proposed isolation points. Now, just pausing there and looking at that paragraph, you say that turning off the gas had not been a priority for the LFB up to that point and that that was understandable. Can you just explain why you thought that was understandable at the time? There was, there was so many things going on. They were having meetings in the command units. They were talking about all sorts of stuff. Um, they, they, I don't think that they thought that getting the gas off at that exact moment was their priority. They was obviously still dealing with the fire, potentially getting people out of the building. But, you know, I, I didn't discuss any of that with them, but it was that was their focus of putting their own plans in place rather than us doing the isolations. So that's why I went to them <coughs> and, and not waiting for them to come to us because, again, I knew that that gas would have to go off. Were you, at this stage, made aware of any frustrations on the part of firefighters about the gas not having been isolated? No. Was anything said to you about the possibility of gas fueling or reigniting sections of the tower? At this time, no. What about at any later stage? Did you ever have any conversations with any firefighters <coughs> where they were expressing concern about the gas fueling the fire? Absolutely, later in the day, um, I was informed a couple of times that they could hear uh, potential uh, mini explosions, which could be the meters uh, getting to a point where the gas is in them, which is combusted. Um, there was flames still coming in certain areas, which where the risers went up in the building looked like they could be potentially uh, burning gas. And at, at some point later in the day, when the, when it got a little bit later, you could see the orange flames and the gas flames in the flats. That was what was fueling the fire. Can you remember, first of all, you say you had a couple of conversations with firefighters to that effect. Can you ha give us any idea what time you were having those conversations in the day? I think it's in my statement, to be fair. Um... I think we might come possibly to that in a moment, but can you recall now when those when, conversations when we was, were? When we were first being concerned about the gas being alive. Okay, so you said later in the day, yeah. not, you say not at that point, yeah. no one was talking to you about concerns about gas fires burning but later in the day you said they were I think can you remember two, when three o'clock onwards it started to become more of a conversation with the lfb of, of progress yeah now you've explained that the lfb agreed your plan and that between 8 50 a.m and 11 30 a.m you did a number of things First, you say you walked the area with the Level 6 su network supervisor, Peter Baynard, yeah. and you found all these uh, three isolation points. So were you walking the area again once no, you presented? No, I think that's maybe sort of come a bit sort of... 
out of order in yeah, your statement. Yeah, that, that was what yeah. we did between that first... So once you've presented your plan to the LFB, what did you do next? So once we'd uh, obviously identified where we was going to do the isolations, I then had to look at all the resource had available. I got everybody back to the muster point um, and then uh, divided the people up into teams. So there, I had repair teams there, I had JCB drivers there, I had vacuum excavator plant there, um, min mini excavators. I had lots of options, got them all there ready. So then it was putting them all into teams to work in the relevant locations and then trying to get them to them points, bearing in mind that it was fire engines, ambulances and all sorts of other vehicles obstructing us from getting to where these isolations were. Yeah, we're going to come to that little, that, that briefing that you did uh, in a moment. You say that you requested something called a network analysis. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so a network analysis is similar to what we've seen with all the mains in the whole area. It, it just, it, it's, a, it's a formality of procedure that if you're going to isolate sections of main, you need to know what impact that will have on the network. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, it's a formality that you do when you do any procedure of uh, flow stopping mains you, you, over, over an eight inch and above, you have to do that as part of our procedures. So it's basically just telling us what the impact will be on the, on the network and it, there was no impact to isolate the mains other than lose supply to Grenfell, which is what we wanted. Yeah, yeah. You say that around midday you returned to the command unit to say that you thought the cutoff was going to take until 7 or 8 p.m. that evening. Can you explain how you made that estimation as to how long it was going to take? So we, we've got to physically excavate ground, enough ground to be able to do these operations in. So you're looking at holes that could be sort of like three, four, five, six metres long, down to a metre, metre and a half deep with other plant, cables, utilities in the way. Um, we, have, we have to excavate that, some by hand, some by machines. So generally, if we were to go and do an isolation on the main, it would take you pretty much all day just to get the excavations done. So in previous experience, I just knew that we're, doing th we're, we're going to do three excavations in, in one day. So I was just trying to give a, an indicative time as to what sort of how long it would take to get them prepared. Yeah. You, you've said in your statement the LFB obviously wanted the supply of gas to be disconnected as soon as possible, but they understood that we were going to do our best to isolate it as quickly and safely as we could. I, is that right? Yeah, again, it's explaining to them what, what we have to do. To it's, again, Unfortunately, it's not just like turn a valve off, it's actually isolating, excavating, isolate, flow stopping. And they understood that once I explained it to them, that's why it would take the time it, it would take. What was their reaction when you first said it's going to take till 7 or 8 in the evening? If you could do it quicker, then great. I said, well, I've got the resources here. You know, we'll go as quick as we can, but we can only work as quickly as, as in, a, in a safe manner as we can. And at that stage, did the LFB give you any explanation as to why they were wanting it quicker? Were there any particular concerns they had about gas at that stage? When we started... So this is, you go back to the command unit around midday and you tell them it's going to be... In, not cut off till the evening. Can you remember whether they said anything to you about particular concerns they had at that stage about the gas? I just think they, they mentioned that there were still fires burning on, on, on the higher floors, so they, they said that they don't know whether that's the gas or not at that time, so it's just, it's just to um, take that out of the equation to get the gas isolated. Yeah. So turning then to the briefing, you say what you did was you pulled everybody back to the muster point at 12.30 and you gave them a briefing um, Peter Baynard describes your briefing as inspirational in, in, in his statement. What did you say? I mean, what, what did you have to say to them at that point? Well, again, I think being at that training from Morton on the Marsh with the, with the um, fire brigade, it was, it was made quite clear to me there that when you go to an incident, you might see things, you may hear things, you may be working in situations where you might see things you might not want to see. And... You're only there to deal with the gas, and that's all you're there for. That's our priority, safeguard life and property. So I'd walked around, I'd seen some things which weren't very nice. Um, I'd seen that the whole um, entirety of what was going on, it, it was you know, nothing I've ever seen before. So I just wanted to really prepare the guys uh, that were gonna go to work at these locations to make sure they 
were going to see any hidden surprise. They, they knew what they was up against, but at the same time, I was there to support them with whatever they needed. And, and you say at that point, you then deployed the teams to each of the three isolation points. And, and you say in your statement that you deployed two repair teams to each of the three points. Um, and then you've also said each team consisted of eight to ten individuals. Does that mean eight to ten individuals at each of the three points? Correct, or, yeah. So yeah. I, I had repair team leaders. I had six, maybe seven there. Uh, so t two on each repair team, leaders, which would consist of two-man teams. And then I had additional resource, which I could use to do whatever we needed them to do, basically. So mm -hmm. there's repair team leaders at each location, experienced guys, uh, and then the, the guys there support support workers as well, working underneath them. And what was your role once you've deployed the teams to each of the three points? What were you then having to do? I was just um, overwatching all of them, keeping the fire brigade updated with communication, feeding back into Tony Day, um, you know, making sure that the guys were okay. Yeah. Having breaks, getting water, getting food, getting everything they needed to make sure they could work comfortably. Any, anything they needed, make sure we could get it there for them. And we touched on this earlier. Can you just describe in simple terms what each isolation had to involve? What? So we'll start with the, the 180 mil. So that's, that's, plas that's plastic polyethylene. So with that one, we had to excavate enough pipe so that we could put, we, we don't have to put. Um, inflatable bags and then we squeeze the plastic with what we call squeeze offs, they're clamps. So they, they squeeze the plastic and then we can cut a section out and then put two caps on and that basically was the plastic is the plastic isolation. So is that so you call it a squeeze off, is that like a tool? It's a big tool, yeah, which is a hydraulic jack in essence which pumps two clamps together and it clamps the plastic together and that stops the flow of flow of gas. So you have to do one each way. And once them caps, once they're squeezed off, we check the pressures, and then we can put caps. And the plastic it. doesn't split or deform when you're doing that. The way that it's made, no, it's been no. designed and tested uh, to do to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, for the other mains that aren't polyethylene plastic. So for the what's metallic involved ones, with those? you have to again excavate, get right the way around them, and then we have a system which is called a 312 bagging off system, which basically in essence is three inch to 12 inch mains. We have to put um, three drillings either side of the cup um, and then we insert a bag in and we, you blow the bag up uh, with air which then obviously seals inside the main and that again stops the flow of gas. So you have to do six drillings, two, two bags each side of the cup and then once the bags are in and then you've got a, deep, a good seal, we can cut the main and then we can put caps on. So you're basically like inflating a balloon inside the pipe. Yeah. So that balloon stops the gas. Yeah, so it's and made out of a special it. bag. It's a, it's a balloon inside, <laughs> like a material bag, which is specially for the gas, which seals inside. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you put three either side of the cut? Two bags either side of the cut, two, two. and then another drilling, which is basically what they call it, it's a, a bypass over the top, so that we can monitor the gas either side of the, the cuts as well. In terms of the, the 180 mil um, point on Grenfell Road and the four inch main at Testerton Walk, can we just look at your statement again? So if we go to MET 00012710 at page 10, paragraphs 47 and 48, can we zoom in on those? So picking it up in the second line down of 47, you say, we face further delays reaching the 180 millimeter main and the four inch main sites, that's points three and four on the maps, because of the restrictions. Both of these sites were situated within the inner exclusion safety cordon. Unfortunately, the keys to one of the fire engines, which had to be moved so our machines could reach the isolation point, had been taken back to the depot when the fire officers were changing shifts. I escalated this to a male LFB incident controller at around 1350, and he arranged for the keys to be returned to the site so that the fire engine could be moved. And then you also say excavations on the 180 millimeter main and the four inch main commenced at approximately, so it's 2.30 in the afternoon, Despite our best efforts, none of our machinery could reach the site where the four inch main was located. And the team therefore had to hand dig the ground to locate this main. 
The team working on the 180 mm main had to start the excavations by hand because there were other cables identified in the network. However, they were able to introduce a JCB to complete the excavations. So it, it sounds from that like you faced a number of challenges with the excavations, is that correct? Yeah, we did. It was getting access, like I say, close enough. There was uh, like an LFB pump hot right in the middle. We, we did get quite a few moves, but this particular one we, they couldn't find the keys for. Um, so we had to wait for them keys to arrive before we could get our vans passed and so all of our safety equipment's on there. So we did start carrying stuff down by hand and making the start, but we use breakers, which are pneumatic, which are run by air, which is fed from the van. So we have to get the vans close enough to, to get them breakers going. Um, and then the pumps were feeding the, 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 the water pumps. So we had to get ramps made to get over the pump. So we weren't stopping the water from getting up to the, where they were obviously putting the fire out. So we had lots of challenges just to get started. Yeah. In terms of that 180 millimetre main in Grenfell Road, you say in your statement that the excavation commenced at 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon and you completed at about 8 p.m., is that right? Correct, yeah. And did you have any problems actually locating the main when you were Wh Which there? one, sorry? The, the 180 mil one on no, Grenfell no, Road. No, no issue locating the yeah. main there, no. And then in terms of the four-inch main at Testerton Walk, this also began, you say, the excavation at 2.30 in the afternoon and also completed about 8 p.m., is that right? It, that is correct, yeah. Bearing in mind, we, we had to retreat a couple of times away from the excavations. I'm going to come to that right, in a moment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you've said that that had to be hand-dug. How much additional time do you think that hand-digging added? Again, I put additional resource onto that. Um, excavation so we did rotation so uh, I wouldn't have said a lot to be fair they, they worked really hard the lads in, in excavating that they, they didn't stop so we had plenty of resource there um, to keep working on it yeah. in terms of the, tr the the main at station walk you say that you deployed a team to that um, so the excavation started at about 1 30 p.m. but you the team struggled to trace the pipe and had to carry out five excavations before locating it. Is that right? That's correct, because we started the excavations from the governor, with looking from where that, because we, we knew that they were coming out from that point, so we thought that's going to be a great place, but the drawings were slightly different to how the configuration of the pipe came out, so we couldn't get a section long enough along the pipe to do a, a flow stop. So we decided to jump over and go down a little bit further down the station. Well, that's why I think that the locations are slightly out where we did the isolation. So we, we looked in one place, so we, we had two or three excavations by the governor to look for it, we couldn't find enough pipe there. So then we, we thought it was underneath the wall, which we thought would be unsafe to dig where the wall was. And then we moved further down before we actually found the top of the main. So yeah. we did spend a, a couple of hours excavating, looking for the, for the asset. So might that explain why we saw the zoomed in map near the governor because actually you were originally planning that, on excavating correct. quite close to that yeah but you had to get pushed up station walk correct because it didn't come out the governor as the drawing showed unfortunately yeah did you use any any equipment such as radio signal detection to to locate the ca the cable the cable so, sorry, the, the main the gas main sorry to locate the main we, we did um again uh, it's it's very hard sometimes unless you can get a direct connection onto the actual piece of equipment you're trying to trace because there's lots of other plant and utilities in the ground now and unfortunately they lay a lot of it over the gas. So sometimes you pick up a signal which you think is a really good signal for the gas main and when you drop down you might find that it's a cable that's been put in or some other part of some other utility. So we did use our uh, Cat and Jenny tracing equipment and can that, does that equipment go into a more sensitive mode? Are there different kind of modes you can use? If you can get a direct connection on, yeah. then, then definitely, yeah. I see. yeah. And you also say that the pipe was deeper within the ground than you had anticipated. Um, you've said 1.2 to 1.5 metres. Is that how deep it ended up being? That's correct, yeah. Most, yeah. most normally you expect it to be in between 600 and a metre as an average depth for pipes, but they all vary so much. Ground build-up, everything changes, so sometimes the building up the ground makes the 
asset become deeper in the ground. So it was at about 1.2 to 1.5. And, and you mm. went deeper, but you said you decided to proceed without shoring up the sides of the excavation um, as you you didn't think there was going to be a collapse and you were keen to save time. Is that right? Yeah, well, our standard procedure, again, is anything 1.2 um, to install trench support unless down to 1.5 um, the ground is, is self-supporting um, and it looks, it looks stable, then we can still issue ourselves a permit to carry on excavation, but we know that we're working at a depth where we could, we need to make sure that we're always checking any, any excavation. If there's unstable ground, you need to shore it and, and support it. Does the fact that the mains were deeper suggest this was an older pipe? Mm, not necessarily. Right, yeah. Um, and then your team used a mini digger to excavate the ground as you weren't able to use something called a vacuum excavator that you normally use, is that right? Yeah, so... Can you explain the difference? So uh, a mini excavator is a small machine with a small arm, a small bucket, which, which takes out grounds steadily. Um, a vacuum excavator is our new innovation equipment which we're using now, which actually is like a big hoover. So a big pipe comes over and we have a, something called an air, an air lance which fires high pressured air into the ground which loosens the ground and then this actually sucks the ground out. So it's a safer reason we don't hit other plant cables and we can excavate a lot quicker with that than we can with by hand. So unfortunately I just couldn't get that machine close enough <laughs> due to other restrictions. Yeah. <coughs> so was, was it slower using the mini digger than it would have been with it, the... It was a little bit slower, but what we did was, once we started and once we identified the depth of it, we pulled a JCB in, which is a bigger digger, and it, it, it can excavate ground quicker. Yeah. So I'm about to do, turn to a different topic, which is about entry into the basement. Um, right. And I think if we have a break now, <coughs> there is a good chance I can finish this morning. Well, you take whatever time. So I think, I think a 10 minute break now. I just think Mr. Alday might like a bit of a break now. We'll have another short break, Mr. Alday. Okay. No discussing you. your evidence, please, with anyone else while you're out of the room. We'll start again at 5 past 12. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> Good. 5 past 12, please. Thank you.
right? Ready okay. to carry yeah. on? OK. Good. Yes, yes thank you, Mr Alday. So while these excavations <coughs> were happening to the three isolation points, the LFB asked you to go into the basement of the tower to see if your teams could turn off the gas from there. That's right, isn't it? Correct, yeah. And you say that they asked you at around 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Is that right? Around that time, yeah. Was this the first time you were asked to go in? It was, yeah. And was it the first time you were asked to get close to the tower at all? Yes. And you say in your statement that it was the first real push you had from the LFB to get the gas off. You say that in paragraph 54 of your statement. Can you explain what you mean by that? I, I could feel one from the conversation that they, they wanted to get the gas isolated as quick as they can. I think they'd identified that the gas was burning um, in some of the floors. So they said, is there any quicker way? And we discussed that there is valves in the basement. Um, so they asked if it's possible to go in to see if we could isolate the valves within the basement for the risers. And was that the first time that you considered going into the basement? Yes. And is there a reason you didn't ask to go in any earlier, so during that morning while you were planning the other operations? Yeah, when I was w walking around, um, again, we could see the debris which was falling from the building all around the side where the gas was, because the gas was predominantly on, the, on this side of the building. When you say on this side? South, on the south side. Are you sure it was on the south side? So if you're looking at the building, yeah. from, from the front entrance, we was this side. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. So, and the sub, the, the sub basement door was on the east side. Yes. So um, that was, there was so much debris, like a good couple of three foot of debris on the floor, which had fallen down. So, and it was still falling. So the answer to the question is no, we hadn't thought of going in because of what was going on. Yeah. Can we just look at what you're, you, you say in your statement about this? So if we can go to your statement, that's met triple zero one two seven one zero. At paragraph 53 on page 11. So you say the fire was still burning at this point and I believe that the LFB thought that the gas may be feeding some of the fire inside the building. The LFB were becoming increasingly concerned about the structure of the building. I asked Andy if it was safe to enter the tower and told him that if his officers were prepared to go in that I would follow them to assess the situation. I was not prepared to send my men into the tower until I had carried out a risk assessment. Andy understood that decision. Now, when you refer there to Andy, do you know who that Andy is that you're referring to? Again, I can't remember his surname, Don't worry, no. that's fine. And when you say you believe that the LFB thought the fires were still feeding the, it, the fire inside the building, did they specifically say that to you? We think there are gas fires yes. feeding the fire in the building. Yes. So that wasn't just your assumption, that no, was that, what they said? they said, yeah. And you say that you agreed to go in and that the purpose was to check if it was safe for your team to go in, is that right? Yeah, I wouldn't have sent everybody in. Um, I just wanted to see if it was safe to send a couple of guys down to isolate these, vi these valves in, in the sub-basement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've said that access to the basement <coughs> was delayed because the LFB had to get a key to the basement. Did you think that it was Cadence's responsibility to try and get access to that basement any earlier? No. And did you consider it necessary to try and obtain plans for the basement before you went in? No, because I spoke to Pat Kelly who told me, he'd already informed me where the gas risers were within that building. So you didn't feel there was any need for you to have a plan? Was that because you, you thought you because could Because I knew where them? they were and secondly because I didn't think that I'd ever be going in there to be honest. Yeah. When you say you knew where they were, where was that exactly? In the basement. Yeah. In the corners. That's where the four risers went up. Right. Inside. So you knew to look in the corners, is yeah. that right? Yeah. So you weren't concerned about the layout of the basement or identifying them before you went in? Um, again, Pat Kelly was on site with me and he was quite confident he knew where they were because he'd been in there. So yeah. there was no concern for that. Now, you say you actually entered the basement at about 3.30 p.m. that afternoon on the 14th. So that was nearly two hours of, after being asked to do so by the LFB. What were the reasons for the, the delays in getting in? You've talked already about the key. 
Was there anything else that needed to happen before you went in? Um, so the key, the key was quite a, a, a timely delay. And secondly, it was, again, formulating a bit of a risk assessment and putting things into place and agreeing that with the fire brigade about yeah. how we was going to enter because there was stuff still falling from the building. You talk about doing a dynamic risk assessment. So you actually formally did a risk assessment before you went in, did you? Not wrote down, but in my head, yes. Yeah. And how long do you think it took you to, to do that risk assessment? 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And you went in with Patrick Kelly from Cadent, is that right? Yeah, I wasn't f first aware that Patrick was coming in with me until I turned around and saw that he was there. Yeah. And three LFB officers, is that right? Maybe four. All right, OK. Because they were holding riot shields above our heads to get to the door. I was about to ask you about that. So in order to get to the basement, you had to be shielded from the falling debris, is Correct, that right? Correct, yeah. By policemen with riot shields, or it, it was fire. It was fire. the LFB. Yeah. I, yeah, I think the statement was wrong there. It says police, but it was the LFB. And you say you used a side entrance. Which do you mean? I think you said you thought it was on the east side. East side was the, was the only door going into the sub basement. Now, as to the conditions in that basement, can you just describe for us what it was like down there when you got down? So it was quite dark at first. Uh, there was natural light coming from behind us. Um, there was a lot of water pouring in, as you can imagine from what had gone onto the tower. Um, the couple of the firefighters went in first, that they stepped down and I could see that there was water. So I sort of just gazed by how big they were, I thought well I only had my ankle boots and PPE on my trousers but I, I stepped in and it came up to about my knee, just to blow my knee. Um, and then we started, as soon as I stepped, turned around the corner, I could see the first riser in the corner. Um, and then we started to walk around. And then I noticed that there was like power units with lights still on. So to me, straight away, the electric was on in the building. Yeah. And I asked the fire brigade if it had been isolated and they said, they'd said no. And I said, it wasn't really a good mix, I stood in this water with all that electric in there. So, um, at that point, I'd had, I, I'd had visually made contact with a couple of the risers, but I heard, overheard on the radio a command from the command unit, I'm just assuming that the building was declared unsafe and everybody to get out, so we, we, we got out straight away. Okay, yeah. So you said you realised when you were down there that the electricity was on. Did the LFB have torches as well? They did, yes. Yeah. Did that help you identify the gas rises? Yeah, because we looked up, we were always looking up because it's high, it's, it's like 10, 12 foot high in, in the basement where, the, where yeah. the risers come in. You've also said that the gas boiler lights were on. Um, does that mean that the boilers were still on? Or? Uh, not necessarily, because there, there was a large supply going into the basement. On the maps, it's, there's, there's a 10 inch which goes in, which was for the communal heating and, and, and hot water and then there was the, the risers were for cooking or, or whatever so there was yeah. there was a big boiler in the basement I believe which fed all of the hot water and heat into the tower and the three fingers which came away from it as well yeah now you also say that you couldn't see any spindles to turn these risers off as you looked up I could see the valves right? yeah I couldn't see the handles to turn so, them off so can you just explain the difference so the valve is a um, in line in the pipe and it have a little spindle sticking up and that's what operates to open and close the valve that turns um, and so there's different types of key that can turn off there's it could be a wheel which sits on it which you just turn a wheel there could be a spindle which come off which you can turn that by hand from higher or lower down depending on how the valves installed or you can use a pair of grips basically mm -hmm. to turn it off if, if all else fails so that's what the valves, how the valves made up, and that's I how see. you operate it. So you could it. see valves, but not spindles. I could see the yeah. valves, I could see the spindles on the top, but there wasn't a wheel or, wasn't or a wheel. anything to turn it with in the basement on the two that I saw. So does that mean, let's suppose you could have got up there with a ladder and started, how would you have had to do it in those circumstances? I would have asked the lads on site if they'd had, if they had a wheel in their van, uh, uh, they called triple five valves, if any of them had a wheel to use. If not, we would use grips to talk. Is it just a square-headed spindle? Just a square-headed spindle, yeah. so yeah. yeah. So you were actually equipped to operate the valve, if, if only by the use of some grips? 
Correct. Yep. <coughs> but the bigger valve for the 10 inch, that, oh. that one was not quite so accessible. Now, you, you said just a moment ago that at that point you got a call from the LFB that everyone had to get out and evacuate. I'm going to read a passage from your statement in a moment about that. But um, before that happened, how long do you think you'd been in the basement for before you were told to get out? Only a few minutes. Yeah. Three, four minutes, maybe five. So uh, let's sorry, could you, you mind if I just follow no, up one no, no, thought? <coughs> you said the valve on the 10 inch was not so accessible. Was there a separate valve on the incoming 10 inch pipe, which if closed would shut off the gas to everything in the building? No, because the, oh. the, the, the 10 inch was an independent supply which was feeding the communal stuff. Oh, it's just for the boy. Communal stuff. The, 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 the smaller ones were coming in, which, which were the risers which were going up through the building. And they were independent? Correct, it's correct. So yeah. this is an important Thank point. You. So my understanding is the risers that go up are for gas for cooking purposes? Yeah, they, I don't know the building inside. There may have been some that were used it for heating separately, but the, they did have communal hot water and heating from that yeah. main boiler downstairs. And there were boilers both in that building and other building that were served by a different gas yes. system. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Sorry. We're going to come to that in a moment, actually. Um, so if we can go back to your statement, that's um, MET 00012710. At paragraph uh, 56 which is on page 12. And you, thank you. And you say this, so um, about halfway down, before I could look any further, the LFB officers received a message via their radio control instructing us to retreat from the basement. I overheard the command, all out, all out, all out and confirmed with the LFB officer that this meant that we had to evacuate the building. As I was coming out of the basement, I saw other LFB officers leaving the building and saw the third two-inch riser and the gas supply to the communal boiler. I also saw that the electricity in the basement was still alive and immediately retreated from the building because they were concerned that the building would collapse. All the fire officers who were in the tower at the time had to retreat from the building. So just hovering on that for a moment so as you exited you, you saw that third two inch riser is that right yes so you identified three of the four while you were in there yes and again was that at high level it was as yeah. with the other two and you also say this is the point we were just on that you could see the gas supply to the communal boilers and again was that um at low level no it was high level as well yeah and just to clarify if you turned off the supply to the communal boilers would that have helped turn off the gas to the risers? No. So you had to do both things yes. if you're going to turn it off. Yeah. And you also say this at paragraph 57. It's on the same page. Yeah. If we were to have isolated the supplies in the basement, we would have had to take ladders down to the basement for the team to reach the valves and disconnect the supply of gas through the risers. Unfortunately, turning off the valves on the risers was not something that I could have done during the short period of time that I was inside the building. I estimate that it would have taken a team of approximately four men working inside the basement with someone from the LFB to accompany the team up to an hour to turn off the valves on the risers. Regardless of this, the live electricity and water in the basement was a real risk to life, and I was not prepared to send any engineers back into the basement. Now, again, just pausing there on that. Is it your, your experience, in, in your experience, is it normal for the isolation points on these kind of gas risers, these riser branches, to be so hard to access? It's the way the building was made up. The, the sub basement went down, the supplies come in at high level because in the ground. So um, they're not, I wouldn't say that they was the actual isolation valves. They'd be more of an inline valve from construction purposes. The actual isolation valve would have been just outside the building. That's what we would yeah. always would have gone for first. The, so you'd normally go, as we established earlier, for the, the, the PIVs, the correct. pipeline isolation valves outside the tower, just outside the perimeter. Yes. 
I, I've been so these to, aren't the ones you're normally expecting to use. Correct, that right? and, and they was not accessible. And I've been to quite a few fires and been there for to, or for the uh, response of gas. And I don't know if I've ever been into a building before to even go and look for them. It was something that we made a decision because of what was going on that we thought that that could be a good decision to make. But so we wouldn't even normally go in and look for them valves in a building that's on fire. Mm. And after you came out, you, you say in your statement that you were told by a structural engineer that there had been some unacceptable movement in the building, is that right? That's correct. And did you speak to that engineer directly? I, I did, yes. Did you have any kind of conversation with him about, I was sorry, was it him? It was him. I, I don't recall his name, but I recall him telling me they had lasers on it and there was movement on the building. Did you discuss with him whether it might be possible to get back in the basement? Um, with the structural engineer, no. Yeah. At 8.15 p.m. that evening, the LFB asked you if you would go back into the basement to shut the gas off again. Now, at that point, you say you didn't think it was safe for your teams. Is that right? Yeah, it wasn't safe at all to go in there. And is that because of structural instability in the tower? It was a number of things. The structure of the building, um, the, the water in the basement, the electric was still on. There was a number of factors there which outweighed us being able to go in there safely. Now, Tony Day, your line manager, says in his statement that he instructed you not to go back in the basement because the electricity hadn't been isolated. Was it his instruction or was it your decision not to go back in? So the, the, the LFB requested, and obviously um, I didn't feel comfortable with it, so I had um, a hierarchy there, which I used. I, I spoke to Tony and he said no, basically. He, he made a decision for us. At any point, did you consider whether it would be worth discussing the risk with a structural engineer? No. Or discussing whether the electricity could be turned off? We or? asked if the electricity was going to be turned off, and it, we were told it was in progress, but I never found out whether that got done or not. We was more um, concentrated now on, we were well into our isolations to get these done. So do you think that any of that was a practical option for you? To go back in? Yeah. Not, not, I don't think so, no. Had your team been able to get into the basement earlier in the day, do you think you might have been able to turn the gas off quicker? Again, I would have requested for the electric to be isolated. Again, once I knew that was on, I would have requested them. I don't know how long it would have taken them to turn that electric off. Yeah. So I wasn't willing to wait for that. On an unknown, I'd rather have continued with our isolation process, which was the decision we made and stuck to. Yeah. I've now got some questions about um, your working inside the inner cordon. Um, so shortly after you exited the basement, the inner safety cordon was moved and you say it was extended so that it covered a wider area, is that right? That's correct. And you say the effect of that was that the isolation points at Testerton Road and Grenfell Road were now inside the inner cordon, is that right? They were, yes. And so is it right that you decided at that point that you pulled the teams out at that point? We was asked to um, uh, get them away from the excavations at that point by the LFB. You say that at 4.30 that you, Tony Day and James Harrison went to see the LFB and you asked if your operatives could return to the Testerton Road and Grenfell Road points um, because you wanted to agree a safe way of working, is that right? That's right, yeah. And you say that you eventually agreed that your team could return with LFB spotters watching for signs that the tower was structurally unsafe. Is that right? That's correct. How finely balanced do you think that decision was in terms of allowing you back in to, to, to keep going? Again, it was communication with the LFB because at first they said you, you work under your own safety systems, but we wasn't prepared to work there because we were in their, they, they were the prim, primary... Um, responders there, so we was working under their um, exclusion zone inside there. So we, we came up with a plan of having a radio contact so everyone could see where we was working and if there was any signs of um, collapse or anything like that then we actually had fire officers stood right next to us and then some a few metres away and a few metres away so they was actually watching us and making, watching the building give us a little bit of support if anything was happening to get us out of there quickly. Yeah. And you say that at um, 5.20 that afternoon, your repair teams began working again on Testerton Road and Grenfell Road. 
but that then at 20 past six, the LFB again said the building was unsafe and told you to retreat. Is that right? That's correct. And you say in your statement you wouldn't pull out at that point. Is that right? Um, have, we, have we got that bit? I'm not sure about yeah, that. Yeah, we can find it in your statement. Mm. You, say, you say that you wouldn't pull out because... Uh, you didn't want to stop, so that you did a dynamic risk assessment and think, you decided that... I think we agreed to continue to work between exactly. ourselves and the... You know, we was that close to, to pull out again for a duration of time. It's only going to delay the isolation. So, you know, if I was told I had to go, we, we would have gone, but we was that, that involved, that engrossed in, in getting the isolations complete. We agreed of a way of continuing to work under the safe system of work that we'd already put in place. Yes, I think it's, so it's paragraph 62 of your witness statement, um, so it's on page 13. If we can just zoom in on that. So there, you, you received the information that the building was unsafe and the teams had to retreat from the excavation site again. You say, I was feeling the pressure to isolate the gas quickly and knew that we needed to continue with the excavations to locate the mains. I discussed the situation with Tony Day. Tony could see that we were close to finishing the excavations with approximately an hour's work left to complete and agreed that we could continue with the work. The LFB was satisfied with this decision and we kept them updated with our progress and ongoing dynamic risk assessment. Yeah, so it wasn't that I said I wasn't going to pull out. I, made, I wanted to be strong and continue to work and get it completed. Yeah, understood, yeah. It sounds like these were quite tense moments on site in terms of whether you were going to be carrying on working. Is that right? It was very tense, yeah. Turning then to the completion of the isolations, at 8pm the mains at both Testerton Road and Grenfell Road were cut and capped. We talked about that earlier. But the gas was still <coughs> not cut on uh, Station Walk. Um, as to that, the, in terms of the timings, you say that... The, your team exposed the pipe at 9.30 p.m., but then discovered that the pipe was a 15-inch, not a 12-inch main. You say that isolating a 15-inch pipe, you mentioned this earlier, is, is a non-routine operation, and that you would ordinarily require the attendance of your pipeline maintenance centre. That's that correct, right? yeah. So they're called PMC. So why are they needed for a 15-inch main? So as I explained earlier, our... Um, our, our flow stopping equipment is 312, 3 inch to 12 inch, that's the standard sizes. After a 12 inch, so a 12 inch is a routine operation which we can carry out um, ourselves. Anything that's over a 12 inch is a non-routine operation and therefore it has slightly different equipment to be used to do the isolations. Um, so that's why we use a, a contractor to do that. Um, and it's, it's a slightly different skill set, so we're trained up to do anything up to 12 inch there and then, and any, anything bigger than that we, have to, we do have to get a specialist contractor in. So it's a more complex operation for 15 it, inch? It's, it works on the same, um, basically it work, it's the same method, but it's, it's larger bags, we put nitrogen in the bags rather than air because of the size of the bags, so we're not getting an air gas mixture should one of the bags um, <coughs> deflate or, or burst inside the main so that, that it's a little bit more safety conscious we're, we're doing bigger mains um, the cutting equipment slightly different it, it just when you jump up above 12 it's, it's a little, little bit more it is more complex is it more dangerous I mean if you don't get it, it right it's not any more dangerous when you're working on gas it's got to be safe it's got to be yeah. right anyway so it's, 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 the risks are exactly the same um, and the hazards are the same but we, we we do, that is our procedure, that is our policies that we've always worked to, mm -hmm. National Grid, Cadent. Yeah. Now you say that to get your pipeline maintenance centre out, they normally require six hours notice under the agreement that you have with them. Um, is that right? Uh, their, their SLA is to attend any emergency within six hours. Um, bearing in mind that we would still do the excavation work for them. We would get the pipe prepared. We would get all the ground out. So that six hours gives us ample time to get the excavation complete. So when they arrive, they can set to work quite quickly. Yeah. Now the timeline shows that Caden, that you called for PMC at 10.30 p.m. Uh, can you explain why it took an hour after, after discovering at 9.30 that it was a 15 inch main? Why would it have taken an hour to call PMC? Because 
what we did was we had a discussion on site, myself, uh, Neil Moran and a, co a couple of the teams if there was another option that we could potentially do in a temporary isolation to, to um, isolate the, the supply going into the tower. Um, so we, we spent a little bit of time talking about that first uh, and we came up with an idea and a solution which we did and as soon as we did, but once we'd, we'd done that, we'd thought of that, that's when I I contacted them straight away then to, to, to um, mobilise them to get them to site. Yeah. You say that had you known earlier that it was a 15 inch diameter pipe that you could have called PMC earlier, is that right? Of course, yeah. yeah. Um, just going back to, to what you said earlier, you said to us earlier that you deliberately chose the 12 inch site. Um, because that was something you could do within a routine operation, that it, that it didn't occur to you that it was a 15-inch um, site at that time. But given that maps can be wrong sometimes, and given that changes in diameter can occur, as we saw from some of the maps, do you think you ought to have considered the possibility that it was a 15-inch made earlier? I don't think so, no, because the maps that we've seen that shows the 12 inch coming out of the government, it shows the 12 inch coming out of there. Um, it, it, you know, we picked a location where there was um, 12 inch pipe. We, we, we'd had one of the teams had worked on the 12 inch further back and, and confirmed it was a 12 inch, so that at the time there was nothing to indicate to me the section of pipe we were working on was a 15. I mean, that, that distance from the governor to where it shows a 15, you're talking 100 to 120 metres away. So it's showing that much 12 inch pipe in the ground. There's nothing for me to believe or, or maybe even understand that that could have been any bigger. So, yeah. no. And, and just one more question on this. Do you think that in any event it might have been prudent to contact PMC earlier just because of the possibility that it might not be that diameter and it might be a bigger one? It didn't come across my mind, no. Sorry, can I just uh, ask you, you said one of the team had worked on the pipe further back and confirmed it was a 12 inch. Can you in, just... in Bramley Road, so where, the, where it came out of the governor yeah. and that branch which you, you spoke about earlier where it said the 12 inch, that 12 inch turned and went down Bramley Road and someone had worked on it and proved that it was a 12 inch in Bramley Road. Right. Right. Thank you. Do you want to go back to that map? Um, we, can, we can if you like. Would that make, is yeah, it no, we can do that. that. So it's CAD, CAD mm. quadruple zero three zero one five. At page two is the zoomed in version. Yep. So this, yeah. this goes down and goes down into, uh, into Bramley Road. So this Latimer Road runs into Bramley Road. Mm -hmm. So this is the 12, that's the 12 inch there and that continues down into Bramley Road. Right. And that had been worked on and confirmed as a 12 inch. Right, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So, in the event, as you said, you and Tony Day, in conjunction with, the, um, with James Harrison, you took the decision to over inflate a 12 inch bag uh, in an attempt to block the 15 inch pipe. Is that correct? Correct, yes. And is this one of the decisions that you refer to, you say in your statement in general that there were a number of decisions you took on the night which were contrary to your standard practice. Is this one of them that would be contrary to, to what you would normally do? It's not a standard procedure, um, but again, it was in, in, the, in the scenario and the situation that we were in, it was what, what could we do? Um, we would never have cut the pipe behind the bag. Um, it was a temporary isolation. We, we calculated it, we, we blew it up, we put calipers around the bag to, to work out the, the size that it would seal and we, we worked out the, the, uh, the size of the, the 15 and what the pipe would be inside, whether that would make a seal and we gave it go. Uh, we Had got, you ever done it before? Over, not overinflated a bag into a, into a main, no. Um, and, and we had other bags ready to go, blow, ready to go, should that one have failed, we had another one and monitoring the situation all the time until the PMCs arrived. So it held a really, it was a really good seal in the main until um, PMCs arrived to do the, the flow stop, the non-routine operation. Mm. And, and just to be clear, I think you may make clear in your statement that the, the diameter of the pipe at 15 inches is, is round the outside. Of the metallic off, pipe, Of the metallic yeah. pipe. 
So the diameter on the inside of the pipe is often smaller. Yeah, because it's roughly an inch yeah. thick, the pipe, all the way around. So yeah. you're looking at about Which 13 is why inches. Even though the, yeah, sorry. Which is why even though the bag wasn't quite 15 inches, you thought it could work. Yeah, when we measured it, it was about 14, 14 and a half um, fully, fully. We even counted the amount of pumps we got to go it there before it burst. So we knew it was, it was a bit... It was calculated. Did you put in just one of those, or did you put in more than one? We only put in one. We had, we had another one on, on standby if we, yeah. if we should leave one. If, if you'd inserted it and it had failed, what, what would have happened? What do you mean? On the original um, initial time we did it, we didn't get a seal? Yeah. We, we'd have to have just wait for PMCs to arrive. Yeah. And you say that the supply, the gas supply via that 15 inch main was eventually stopped at 11.40 p.m. in the evening, is that correct? That sounds right, yes. James Harrison said in his first statement that the discovery at 9.30 p.m. that it was a 15 inch main did delay progress, but he estimates, he estimates only by an hour. Would you agree with that estimation? From finding that it was a 12 to isolate it as a 15. Finding it was a 15 yeah. at 9.30 to <laughs> isolating. He says he thinks it caused you about an hour's delay. That would be about right as the delay of contacting PMC. That was that hour of thought process and, 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 and sort of um, thinking. And I want to turn back to your, your main statement. That's MET 0012710 on page 15. And if you go to paragraph 72, you say there that the 12 inch flows, the 12 inch flow stopping bags worked and we temporarily stopped the flow of gas to the building at 2340. We watched the fire flames inside the tower diminish almost immediately and there was a huge sense of relief. The LFB were incredibly grateful and Sange, the officer I had been working with, gave me a hug and thanked me. He told me that he could see the pressure that we'd been under, but that we had done a great job. So again, just picking up on that, do you think it was clear from the fact that the fire flames diminished at that point that the gas had been contributing to the fire at that stage? Yeah, it was, it was really surreal actually that we was where we was in Station Walk and we could see 70% of the tower and it was like someone at the top was flicking a light switch off as the flames were going out, which proved that the gas was a light in the building and that had made the isolation the seal and it stopped any fuel getting into that building. Mm -hmm. Had you formed a view at any point earlier about whether gas was contributing to fires in the tower? My personal view? Yeah. At some point I was quite confident, yeah, that it was fueled in the fire, yes. At what point did you form that view? I think when it started to get to a bit later in the day, when you could, like I said earlier, you could see into the flats and you could see in certain flats there was a flame, that the building was pretty much burnt out. What was it that you could see in the flats? Just a flickering of flames, like, which looked like a gas fire. Was it a different colour? There were orange flames, I mean, with what was burnt in the building, you know, it wasn't nothing to sort of say that it was definitely gas, but it was it was flames that looked like it was gas burning from previous experience seeing gas fires. James Harrison says in his first statement that when he arrived on site at 4:30 p.m. on the 14th of June, he concluded that gas was on fire within the building because of the nature of the flames that he could see and also based on his experience. Would you agree that at 4.30 p.m. there were gas fires burning? Again, I was really concentrated on really close to the building at that sort of time, around at the four <coughs> inch and the 180, so I couldn't see into the building. I was at the foot of it, so I'm not looking into it at the same time as James was on the outside. So I'm sort of going on what the fire brigade were telling me and, and sort of dealing with the isolations. I wasn't at a position probably then to look into the building from afar. Um, I just want to look at two um, pieces of evidence which you may not have seen before um, that, that are relevant to this topic, just to ask for your view and, and whether it triggers any recollection. I want to look first at um, a statement of a walkways resident, Nina Masro, 
Uh, her witness statement is IWS 50792, and that's at paragraph 10. Yeah, if we can zoom in. So just to give you some context, she said a little bit earlier in her statement that um, it was a, sometime after 1.10 a.m., so at the very early stages of the fire that her and her daughter started looking. It's not clear precisely when this was, but she says this. She says, my daughter pointed out blue flames at the top of the tower. I saw them too, but at first I did not understand the significance. Then my daughter explained it. Mum, there's blue flames. That means there's gas. The blue flames were moving and rippling like a waterfall, but they were contained near the top of the building and were not moving further down. Now, I appreciate you won't have seen that before today, but while you were on site, did you ever see blue flames at the top of the tower moving and rippling? No. I now want to ask you about a firefighter statement. This is a statement from somebody called Julian Spooner. And if we can get his witness statement up, that's met quadruple zero eight six zero one seven sorry, eight six zero seven one. And if we go at paragraph sorry, it says one nine one, but that sounds um, I may have got a wrong reference there. Doesn't look like we have. Yeah, it's just where in the statement. So he basically says that there were a lot of gas fires burning in the building at 10 a.m. on the 14th of June. Sorry, I've lo unfortunately, I haven't got the reference to... My reference is wrong um, to that specific bit. Um, did, did he... You talked about an, a firefighter officer called Julian earlier in your evidence. Um, and this may have been Julian Spooner. Did he ever communicate to you that there were a lot of gas fires burning at 10 a.m. No, on no. the 14th of June? No, not to me. It wasn't... I'll just find that reference and, and carry on. Now, after you had successfully isolated the gas, you stayed to monitor uh, the station walk main. Is that right? I did, yes. Why did you stay and monitor it? So, the non-routine operation, um, you have to have on site a recognised, competent person, um, which was me at that time. Um, you have to have the um, like skill sets to be able to do that. I was the only person on site at that time who had that. And obviously you have to have an authorising engineer, but the authorising engineer was away from site. He doesn't need to be on site. So I was a competent person. And I just think as well, I'd been there for all that time. I just wanted to make sure that the job was completed and, and done safely and satisfactory. And you say that PMC arrived at about 3.30 a.m., is that correct? Sounds about right, yes. Yeah. And th at that point, there was a permanent cut and cap done of the station walk main, is that there correct? There was. And that you left at 7.15 the following mor morning, is that right? That's correct, yeah. So in total, you were there for 24 hours? I was. Yes, sir. Uh, for your reference, it, it's page five of Julian Spooner's statement where he talks about gas fires burning. Would you like me to go back to that? Well, it... it, 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 it literally, it, it, all he says is there were gas fires right. burning at 10 a.m., so <coughs> I think we've got, the, we've got the point. So it's page five. Just one more question at this stage. Um, would you have been made aware in your role of any complaints about gas installations or gas pipes at Grenfell Tower before your involvement that night? Unless we'd been there to a repair, no. No. And were you aware? No. no. Is there anything else that you would like to add 
to your evidence. I have to pause in a moment and find out if there are any additional questions. Uh, but is there anything else at this stage that you would like to add? It, it was just one of the most challenging situations I've ever been to and being there 24 hours and having to make decisions to do what we did uh, and going against our procedures a bit. You know, I had a great team above me and I had a really good team below me and, and together we, we, they did, a, they did a, a week's work in, in 24 hours, what we did down there and, and really challenging conditions. So I was quite proud to be part of that, not, not to be because of what it was, but because of what we did and how quickly we did it. Uh, I'm proud to work for Caden and, and, and delivering what we did at, on mm. that night. Okay. Mm. So if that's a convenient moment, yes. we just take a short break. Well, and I'm I can just... Sometimes council finds that the questions that ought to have been asked and have been overlooked. Thank you. Um, so we'll have a five minute break now so, for, for Ms. Grange to take stock. And um, back at 10 to 1, see whether there are more questions for you. Okay. All right, would you like to go to the usher, please? Uh, 10 to 1 then, please. <coughs>
phone up, Ms. Page. Yes, two questions? very brief questions. Good. Uh, so if we can go back to your main statement, that's MET 000 at page 15. And if we can zoom in on paragraph 72. You say there that the 12 inch flow stopping bags worked and we temporarily temporarily stopped the flow of gas to the building at 23.40. Now you've used bags in the plural there. Bag. Whereas early, exa in, earlier in your evidence you said bag and yeah. we just wanted to clarify <coughs> with you. So yeah. that's probably in incorrect. It ought to say the 12 inch flow stopping bag well, worked. Yeah, we, we had one in the main and a couple already next to us, so I was just using as we had the bags to use, and we used one. I think you confirmed that earlier. Yeah. On. Yes, thank yeah. you. And um, the three to twelve inch system that you talked about in terms of flow stopping, yes, is that the ALH system? Uh, no, it's it's a WASC system, W A S K system. We use the ALH system is used on the larger sizes. On the on the non-routine stuff. Okay, I think somebody behind me understands the significance <laughs> of that question. Or at least I hope they do. Um, thank you, Mr. Allday. Um, I have no further questions from you. I'd just like to thank you for coming today and helping us. Yes, I'd like to add my thanks to that. I, I found it very interesting learning about Good. how you go about <laughs> these things, and you obviously did a tremendous job over a very long period of time. Uh, so. Anyway, it's been very helpful to hear all about it. Thank you very much for coming to give your evidence. Well, thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Right, to go to the usher then. Thank you. <coughs> Good. Thank you. Yes, sir. I just have one uh, small task to finish, uh, which is I want to read into the record a schedule of witness statements and exhibits from other cadent witnesses yes. who deal with <coughs> isolating the gas supply on the night. Um, if I can just bring that up on the screen, that's INQ 50529. So this is a list that's um, been circulated prior to this to core participants. It's a, a list of witness statements and exhibits of gas operatives who attended the scene on the night. And I would ask that this schedule of material is now formally read into the inquiry record. Is it, is it more than one page? Just one page. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. And then um, just to announce that this afternoon there will be more reading, reading. in of uh, BSR witness statements uh, for the afternoon. Yes. Well, I think you're right, um, in view of reading in all these statements in, in the compendious way that you've done it, that um, uh, I thank those who've made all these statements. Uh, I'm sure they'll be very useful and, and, of course, they're part of the evidence before the inquiry. Yeah. Um, good. Thank you. Thank that's you. it for this morning. So that's a convenient moment. It is say. a convenient right. moment. Well, we'll break at that point then, thank you, and uh, resume at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much.